Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, for sure. So you're Australian born. Australian born. Uh, your mother was a history teacher. She was, indeed. Okay. Yeah, done <laughs> yeah, did, did a little bit of research on that. Well, I thought it was really cool because you're, you're kind of uh, in your own way now kind of teaching history to people, you know, so you're, you're sort of joining the family business, if you will. A little bit. Yeah. 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 I mean, she's probably glad, actually, that I've now got an audience or, or a channel to talk to rather than just trying to beat the ear off everybody I meet, uh, you know, yeah, in yeah. the public space. And I certainly have been in her area for years about this sort of stuff. Yep. But yes, she was a history teacher. And that was it was always a passion of mine. Like I, I, I nearly went that way at university, but it's like, well, you know, do I want to make money or do I want to have an academic career? Right. So yeah, I went into IT, which was, it's another whole passion of mine. That was always my career yep. uh, until I essentially quit to go do this crazy YouTube thing. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So, you know, for people that don't know, uh, you have your, your channel is Uncharted X it is. and, uh, that's probably what you're most famous for at this point. You've got about what a half, yes, a, half a million followers. Or I so do. It's on. probably the only thing if I'm <laughs> Z list YouTube celebrity famous. I yeah, guess. yeah. 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 That's it. But yeah. Uncharted X, the website too, unchartedx.com. I mean, yep. I publish stuff there. Uh, yep. we have discussion forums there as well, but yeah, we're closing in on about a half a million, which I'm I never thought would happen for, yeah. for like, and it is a super, I, mean, I admittedly know it's very niche content, yep. long form. I don't punch out videos every day or week. It takes yeah. a long time to put them together. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm thrilled and thanks for everybody that does subscribe, I would say. Too. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, for people that don't know, you essentially explore ancient civilizations, you explore our ancient past, and you explore a version of history that's different than, you know, what your mom would have taught in a textbook to, to people, you know, what, what yeah. the, the traditional, the mainstream accepted, the established um, view of history. I do. Yeah. It's uh, the focus is on exploring exactly that, the, the mysteries that are contained in our history and, and mm -hmm. often the contradictions. Uh, I'm not, a lot of my content focuses on Egypt. It's not exclusively there. I, I think there's a lot of factors that should be affecting or should be taken into account when we, when we look at what we would call, if there is such a thing, mainstream or the orthodox story of history mm -hmm. uh, and, and in particular human civilization. Uh, and these aren't purely things that, uh, are to do with inside the field itself you know i think a lot of these these um these uh vectors for change if you like are coming from from other fields of science adjacent fields of science genetics biology you know new new finds in the fossil record climate history the, the evidence for cataclysm all of these things should be playing a role in in i think looking and changing our the, the story of our past i mean it's to me when we look at the story of our history, it's it's a, a good analogy I like to make. It's is that it's it's kind of like a think of it being like a murder case or a criminal case that never really ends, right? You should always be looking at, at the evidence and you should be taking all of the evidence into account and then trying to form a conclusion based on the evidence that you have. I mean, when you're dealing with these murky depths of of the past, we're never going to have like a hundred percent evidence. We're always looking at the skeletons of skeletons of the remains right. of something else. It's right. You know, it's very scant. And in often cases, you know, it's, it's evidence has been gone over before. Like I think concepts like inheritance, renovation, reuse, I think those play a huge role in, in, in trying to decipher the ancient sites and artifacts that we see today. There's tons of evidence for it. And it's, it's, it's sometimes acknowledged, sometimes not, but I think we should have an open mind when it comes to those things. And when you dive into the details, you know, particularly in places like South America, or Egypt or Baalbek in Lebanon, there's just amazing contradictions in the mm. artifacts that we see in the architecture in the technological timeline and the evidence for machining and precision and all of these topics that have you know they, they have they have a real impact they should be having a real impact on the story of history and that, those are kind of the topics that we get into in in a, a fairly nuanced detail at times i'd yeah. say yeah. you have an hour-long video on like tube drills it's, it's, <laughs> yeah okay we got there's plenty of information on them but yeah it's, yeah it's that's the sort of detail we get into yep it's kind of it opens the door i think to this premise of yeah that there there may well it certainly to me seems possible that there was civilizations before like, like far in the past that, that were wiped clean off the planet through events like the younger dryas and that then were then inherited reused you know, potentially sort of gave the dynastic Egyptians, like, for example, a kickstart to their civilization. Um, and then, you know, we are now looking at that through this this lens of, of thousands of years of, of ancient civilizations sort of occupying and using those sites. But there's still these little 
telltale signs, I think, and, and contradictions in, in the story that we know it um, that can shine some light on it. But it's, it's certainly possible. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and that possibility is getting stronger and stronger with a lot of new science that's coming out now, the extension of the human timeline, some of the latest genetic research into the human species, uh, the length of time that we think we've been here. You know, it, and, and we're all humans. You can, you can take humans from at any point in the past, shave them down, put some clothes on them, and they're going to look like you or I. And if you give human beings sort of warm weather enough food to eat, they're going to start solving some problems and, yeah. and organizing. It's, it's a tough one. It's a tough pill for me to swallow to think that, and this is still true to this day, it really hasn't changed for probably 100 years or more, that civilization as we know it began only some 6,000 years ago. Right. Yet as a species, we've been here for, for hundreds of thousands of years. I actually think up to potentially almost a million years now. Like that's where some of the latest genetic... Um, evidence and DNA research is, is sort of pointing at uh, in that time for so eight, 900,000, maybe a million, you could. So talk about that, that for up. a second. There was, was it um, teeth that were found is from 800,000 or so years ago? Not teeth. No, they haven't found. So the, the oldest, the oldest um, fossil wreck. So we, we used to think if we go back to Victoria, I mean, if you go back far enough, it was the biblical version, right? 6,000 years. Sure. Uh, you know, and then then it used to be for a long time the thought that we were around 50,000 years old as a species. And this is sort mm -hmm. of Victorian age of enlightenment, early science era thinking. And then, you know, particularly once carbon dating became a thing, as you said, we can't date stone, you need organic material. Mm -hmm. It's called like radio car carbon, radio, radiocarbon dating, C14 dating, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. You know, we had found in Ethiopia uh, human remains that were, I think, around 190,000 years old. And that at that point was, well, that's the oldest human. That's, that pushed back the human timeline to about 190,000 years. But in the last, and a lot of these scientific discoveries and these things that should be affecting history, it's really the last 20, 25 years that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. There was a find in Morocco of a human jawbone that was dated to around 300,000 years. So that, you know, instantly overnight, it's like a, we're a whole third sure. older. And that's, that's still, I think, to this day that the oldest kind of fossil record remains we have of us. But recent studies into things like teeth morphology, uh, that one in particular is a fairly recent study. It was 2019. It looks at the rates of change of teeth. So we know from genetic studies and, 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 and the DNA evidence that like Neanderthals, we have you know, our hominid cousins. We know that we split from a common ancestor. Like there was a common ancestor and then it was a split to Neanderthal and it was a split to, to, to Homo sapiens, us. And looking at the, the rates of, of teeth change, so essentially evolution of teeth. We've seen the teeth of Neanderthals. We kind of have some ideas about the, com the, the, the rates of change from a common ancestor. And based on studies into how quickly teeth change and evolve to get the teeth that we have, mm -hmm. Our teeth would have had to change very quickly to, to make it only within that 300,000 years. It turns out studies, they all show that, no, that's not the case. So based on the rates of, of teeth morphology, the estimates put us at around sort of 900,000 years old in that ballpark, plus or minus, you know, 50, 60,000 years, something like that. Um, so that just teeth morphology alone points at that point, puts us at that point in time. And that's really the minimum, right? I mean, it is. It, I think it, so. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, very, very interesting, fascinating, and stuff just keeps getting older. You know, it's it like, does. Yeah, it does. The the uh, the mainstream theory of um, of um, you know who we are, where we came from, it just keeps backing up. I mean, as time goes on, it seems like it just keeps getting older all, all the time. I mean, yeah. and th that's not the only one in that area too. There's also been DNA studies looking specifically at when our our genome diverged yeah so we can back up through the genome and and, and that sort of backs that up in that seven to eight hundred eight hundred fifty thousand year range if you know with a as the point of divergence from a common ancestor it's also getting supported like that but yeah it seems you can't you know every time you look on social media or, or look in the news stories things do keep getting older and i mean this applies equally well i'd say to archaeology there's the gobekli tepe people that are interested in this topic would would know about gobekli tepe it's a new discovery of a site in Turkey that, that I think should have pushed back the date of civilization far back thousands of years earlier, but it's, you know, it, it should have really shaken up the world of archaeology. Uh, it hasn't really shifted that date so much, but it did shake up the world of archaeology to some degree. But we, yeah, we keep finding stuff that's just older and older. And mm -hmm. there's been, people don't understand the degree of cataclysm that's occurred on this planet. And it, this is, is again, another, an, an area of what I call new science in the last 20 years. There have been, I mean, one of the reasons I often credit our civilization for getting to its, 
the point that we're at is the nice, pleasant weather we've had for the last, you know, nine, 10,000 years. Mm. And it legitimately is, if you look at uh, the climate history on the planet, this period is is generally the best period of of weather and and you know lack of cataclysm for want of a better term that we've had in the last two hundred and fifty thousand years or so. Like this is a, the Holocene has been a great uh, period and it's been one that supported a lot of growth, but that wasn't always the case. And and we've been learning that yeah more and more frequently, much more frequently than we thought, the Earth goes through these just periods of cataclysm. And and the biggest thing to happen to our planet in around the last two and a half million years of time as far as we know happened only some 13,000 years ago 12,800 years ago it's mm. a period of time called the younger dryas it's actually called the younger dryas boundary uh it's a generally the period of time that separates the pleistocene which is people often think of as the last ice age the last glacial maximum from the holocene which is the the the, the epoch of time that we're in today um and this period is just punctuated by this this 1200 year um uh time frame that that just involved the most catastrophic swings in climate uh there's there looks like there was just a huge flooding all around the world massive wildfires there's there's been there's there's so much science now uh surrounding the younger dryas boundary or younger dryas period that it's it it's i think it's incontrovertible at this point that that this was a cataclysmic event yeah uh, there's still some debate as to what its source was. I think that the science is heavily, heavily leaning towards the idea that the Earth was intercepted by essentially cosmic debris, like the the, the remnants of probably a broken up uh, comet, and it, it was a series of of massive cosmic impacts and air bursts, uh, mostly sent mostly around the northern hemisphere and and uh, and you know particularly North America and Europe, uh, and it caused essentially the rapid end of the last glacial maximum and as a consequence just you know destroyed it would have entirely destroyed any civilization that was here and it it's hard to it's really hard to comprehend the violence of that period of time i mean one thing uh that i like to tell people and obviously you mentioned it earlier was that this is also the period of time that we we had a, a, the last really massive extinction event on mm -hmm. the planet and this was what people often refer to as the megafaunal extinction event the large uh, mammals and, and animals of of uh, North America and Europe, in particular South America as well. So you've got the woolly mammoth, oh, you've got the, um, the saber tooth tiger, tiger uh, the American lion, the the mastodons. There's there's giant species of camels. There were, uh, you know, the sloths and and ground sloths the size of Volkswagen, well, armadillos the size of Volkswagens yeah, uh, and ground sloths that were, you know, six meters tall. They all go extinct around the same time. Pretty much, a very yeah. short period. And, and this this is, people think of it as, yeah, there's a few animals, but it's it's it was literally, and this is according to, to Randall Carlson, and I think a lot of the research has gone into it, it was about half of the megafauna that existed. Mm. So if, if you look at the, we, we sort of date a lot of the megafauna, and by megafauna we mean, I think it's animals or species with more than an average uh, like 40 kilograms or 100 pounds or thereabouts of body weight. Mm -hmm. We're megafauna. Humans included. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely a megafauna. Um, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I qualify. Uh, yeah, and, and it was about half of the species that were alive then. So if, if you look, there's no real new species of megafauna. We look at, if you look at lions and all of the species in Africa, which was one of the places that was less affected okay. by this cataclysm, hence there's megafauna there today. You know, they're all thought to be 2.5 to 3 million years old as a species. These are, mm -hmm. these are species that lived through the Younger Dryas, but there was a tremendous number of species that didn't, including right down to like two or three species of birds, which, is, which I think illustrates the sort of silliness of the overhunting hypothesis. So one of the, the, the way this is explained by in a way to avoid the, the cataclysmic origin of this event is that, you know, and this is still, I think, to some degree, the, the mainstream explanation for this, the extinction of these animals was that, well, humans came on the scene. Overhunting. And we overhunted them. I mean, mm -hmm. not let's not forget that there were probably more mastodons and, and mammoth than there were human at the time, mm -hmm. humans on the planet at the time. And so, so after 800,000 years, we finally figured out how to kill a uh, <laughs> species. <laughs> yeah, right. Kill them, yeah. All of them at the same yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. try to get rid of the bison in America. We had firearms. We didn't manage it. I mean, you know, there's, there's, this is not an easy thing to do. And, and, during that period of time, I mean, we were not, I mean, if humans, the other thing to remember is humans went through a bottleneck here too. There's mm -hmm. uh, Anthony, uh, Antonio Zamora. Tony Zamora has done some great uh, little clips on YouTube looking at 
some of the new genetic evidence looking at our past and the bottlenecks in our own genetic population and diversity. And it turns out that that there were human bottlenecks at the Younger Dryas that are associated with the Younger Dryas period as well. So we not only globally decreased in both population and in genetic diversity during that time, you know, it's, it's so did a lot of species, it turns out. We just, we were one of the species that survived. And if you try to, I, mean, I just, the overhunting thing drives me crazy because there, there were predators like the, the short-faced bear, the American lion. This is a lion the size of a horse. And then the <laughs> short-faced bear was probably one of the most savage predators to, to have ever existed. It's this like is like 14 feet long or 14 something. 14 feet it's, tall. Yeah. It, it had, it's got three or four times the bite strength of modern bears, much faster, uh-huh. more agile, like super predators. You yeah. know, there's, that would have been, you know, if you were a hunter gatherer type of a, of a, of a human having gone through this cataclysm all, However, uh, however you existed, you would not be chasing these things down. You'd be running away from them. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it would have been a, a, a sketchy old environment at night, particularly yeah. in places like the, the, the land bridge between the, you know, between the ice sheets that were in uh, covering North America. I mean, this is a, you know, a, whatever, maybe a hundred miles wide or something, but it's this corridor, which would have focused a lot of these, these, uh, these large animals into, and you like a gauntlet, you'd have to run. All of the sites, and in fact, there's there's several more than this now. This slide's a little dated, uh, particularly around North America uh, and and Northern Europe, but now also in not only uh, South America. You can see the one down the Pilarco in Chile. They've also found this evidence in uh, in South Africa. There are inside the the strata or the layers of dirt. You know, as you dig down, we go back in time. I mean, this is. Is a very well established technique, and in fact, when this research got started, they were using archaeological sites that typically, like Clovis sites in the Americas, go back to about thirteen thousand years. So you have these very well providenced um, layers of 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 strata that correspond to periods of time, and they found that all around the world, in all of these sites, when you get down to that thirteen thousand year old boundary, you find some very interesting data. And there's something called a, a black mat layer. It's like a almost like a, a carbon layer in the dirt there there's all of these things that are referred to as impact proxies so so this is this is this is the evidence or the byproduct of cosmic impacts shock synthesized nano diamonds magnetic microspherules uh, extraterrestrial platinum and iridium spikes all of these things that are essentially byproducts of of these huge explo- like massive like megatons gigatons worth of explosions and some of a lot of it's funny a lot of the research for that uh, and finding out these are byproducts of these types of events was done through nuclear tests. Like that, like a lot of the research that came from early nuclear testing, they thought, okay, these these types of events generate these things like shock synthesized nano diamonds, and they've been finding these in these sites all around the world. So it's this correlation of of data that says, well, yes, yeah, something happened. There's evidence for something happening all around the world at that twelve thousand eight hundred year old time frame. We know there was an extinction event. We know the sea levels rose rapidly in it, like a, not just then, but in, in this period. This wouldn't, it wouldn't have happened instantly over time. Mm-hmm. You know, we know humans had a bottleneck there. Uh, we know that there's impact proxies in the ground. We know that there's evidence for massive wildfires. One of the other things to come out of um, the ice core studies was a study done, again, <laughs> correlating to the Younger Dryas, that there was something like 9% of the world's biomass on fire. Which is just an in- inconceivable number. Like this is from soot particulates that they found in 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 these ice cores. I mean, and you you have to you you combine that with you know the temperature drop. Uh, I think every culture around the world essentially their origin stories involve floods. Ours certainly does, like the flood of Noah, Gilgamesh, many of the South American um, countries and myths and legends talk about you know world-ending fires. Uh, the Mahabharata in India does. I've got lots of examples we can go through. Um, I think, in fact, I think some of these myths and legends are actually like deified and um, what would you say, like like myth versions of what could have been eyewitness accounts to some of these types of events. Um, you know, Revelations is full of them. But all of these things point to this one period of time that it was, you know, essentially we know now was probably the most violent thing to happen to the planet in two and a half million years. And to me, it's it's... It's a huge piece of the puzzle. Like this, this work into into cataclysm is a massive uh, key that unlocks the possibility of of lost ancient civilizations, mm-hmm. and and that also matches these stories. And I think it all that that idea matches 
It's the evidence that we find on these sites, particularly places like Egypt, where we have so much good preservation of, thanks to the weather there, of, of these incredible artifacts. And, you know, to me, the easiest, biggest contradiction when it comes to places like Egypt is, is the most advanced artifacts are the oldest. Like it's the, the people look at the Great Pyramid of Giza. I mean, this is amongst the first pyramids supposedly ever made. Mm. You know, this is a, this is something that gets repeated across artifacts and categories and time. It's one of the things I focus on a lot. But it's like that's not how technology works. This is where the tech part comes in. It's like you ascend. You know, you don't start with a with a Tesla and work backwards to a horse and cart. But we see the equivalent of that in in, in some of the the techniques and technology in places like Egypt. And it's a tough thing to explain, but it be, makes a lot more sense when you when you start to consider the concept of inheritance and reuse and renovation and even cultural connection. I think that humans obviously survived, right? We, we went through this. And if this happened today, the younger dryers, it would end our civilization. Like there might be pockets here and there where, where, where you can go on for a few generations or potentially you foster something that might last a thousand years or who knows, but it's not going to be- would survive and rebuild, but the civilization as we know it today would be gone. Gone. Yeah. I watched your video, The Tale of Two Industries. Yeah. And so you talk a lot in there about, so so obviously the Egyptians, you know, they they're, you credit them for a lot of the stuff that we find, but they're, right. but they're, you know, they obviously accomplished amazing things. They were, they were great stone workers, but right. then there's this other, which appears to be uh, far more precise, far more um, just just accurate set of stonework and and work that right. that's, that that someone has left us with. Whether it was the Egyptians or whether it was a, a civilization that came before them, I think that's the those are the types of questions that you're asking. And yeah. so you you get into a lot of that on your channel. Again, very fascinating. Can we talk a little bit about some of the ancient technology that you see and the contradictions between the two? Uh, the two industries, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And and I do want to qualify exactly what you said, which is uh, that it's like, I, I, I don't feel like by asking these questions, we're taking anything away from the dynastic Egyptian civilization. Uh, that was an amazing civilization. Like they like more than 3000 years. They've lasted longer than our kind of civilization has so far. You know, I mean, it depends which way you think we're going. Um, <laughs> um yeah, and they achieved wondrous things. Like they were an incredible, uh, incredible organization, um, amazing culture. You know, their I think all of their 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 religion, their focus on death and the afterlife, all of that's amazing. That, but they were a Bronze Age culture, and we know the tools that they used. I mean, and we know how they did things based on the scenes on the wall that they would draw, or that the records that we found. And and this. You know, they were using very simplistic tools. And in fact, you can look at sort of some of the tools uh, that they had. Um, do I have their tools here? I don't know. I think I've got the advanced stuff, but we, we can start there. But essentially, the, you know, we're talking about tools like, you know, flint chisels, uh, copper chisels, uh, pounding stones, you know, sand, um, very simple wooden instruments for like alignments and things like that. They were very skilled woodworkers. But their ability to work in, in what I would term, you know, very hard stone, um, and this is typically what you see uh, from the oldest periods of Egypt, is that you see stonework that's done in extremely hard stone, like granite, granite diorite, basalt, things like this, which are just, frankly, a kind of a silly choice to, to work in. Like, yeah. this is, if everyone has like a mortar and pestle at home that's made from granite, I mean, do you protect that mortar and pestle from the tiles on your counter, or, or are you like... You know, protecting the the tiles from the from the mortar and pestle like that. That's what you have to do though, because this thing will break anything that you smash it into. It's mm -hmm. not going to break. Like this is hard stuff. And if you go on the most uh, scale of hardness, uh, which you know I think a fingernail is like a two, you know, a chalk or whatever is like a two and a half or something like that. Copper is is a three three and a half. Iron's four. Uh, steel is five and a half. Uh, and you go up to like where granite can be can be. Five and a half, six, six and a half, diorite, flint, seven, seven and a half, eight, corundums, a nine, diamond being a ten. It, it sort of goes up to about nine, and then you go zhut, up here to ten mm -hmm. for diamond. Diamond is like a fair bit harder than everything else. You know, gemstones, beryl, corundum, things like that are, are, are around a nine. And we see evidence for stones being worked in, that in, go right up to that nine. There's literally vases that come from the earliest periods of time that, that have very high degrees of corundum in them or flint in them. And it's like, this is incredibly tough stuff to work. 
And not only do we see it worked and worked efficiently, we see it worked in just massive scale and with incredible precision. Like that's just mind boggling when you look at it. Everyone sort of may have seen pictures of the pyramids and and the Giza Plateau, but when you go there and it's, it's sort of, I don't know if it just comes at you that fast, but it's like, you've got to remember some of this work, particularly places like the Valley Temple, which is made up of, you know, granite blocks that weigh 60, 70 tons. These are mortalist joints, like they're, they're precisely laid. In fact, let us uh, let me show you one thing here, which I go to Precision Large Directory. I mean, this is an example of, of sort of joins in, in these granite stones of the, you know, of the, of the Valley Temple. There's actually a horizontal yeah. join up top, but there's also a vertical join that you can, you can barely even perceive. And this is absolutely remarkable. I mean, the, 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 the outside of these surfaces of stones, I mean, this is, here's some examples of, of some of the, the joinery that you see in places like uh, the Valley Temple. Um, they're not uniform, you know, they're, they're, they're not linear. The blocks aren't the same sizes. They go around corners. Uh, it's it's truly remarkable, and you you also have to remember that this structure and these objects come from the old kingdom, which is like the start of the Egyptian civilization, the third fourth dynasty of the old kingdom is is where they're attributed. Mm -hmm. And this is fascinating because not only do you see blocks like this in Egypt, but you see blocks like this in South America as well. And yeah. you know the mainstream will tell us that it's from the same period of time, from two different cultures that had never met each well, other, different periods of time, different okay, different periods of time that that had never crossed the oceans, that right. that hadn't met each other. Um, and here we're seeing very very similar megalithic oh. stonework in completely different parts of the world, which if sea level was four hundred feet lower, and we had had a civilization that was able to navigate the world in a more effective way than 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 um, than certainly we could have, you know, um, a couple of thousand years ago. Then your theories become a little bit more. Um, it becomes plausible. It, it it starts to make a little bit more sense seeing all of these giant megalithic stonework, you know, all over the world in, in similar um, construction indeed. methods. Yeah, indeed. It's it's. It, I think it's one of the biggest indicators, and it's 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 you know it's. It's something people have talked about a fair bit, that there is a massive similarity uh, between the, the styles of megalithic building in very hard stone that we see all around the world. And as you said, sometimes, you know, if you take the, the, the stuff in South America in the Sacred Valley of Peru. Is it Sacsayhuaman? Sacsayhuaman around Cusco. Similar to this? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it is. You saw these pictures. I mean, I, I would actually love to show you the, the third pyramid. Maybe I have a picture of that. I don't right here. Uh, but I do have South America stuff here. I mean, you're looking at, at, at stuff like this, which is in the in the streets of Cusco. It's also granite. Uh, you you have these styles, and and if you the mainstream attribution of this stuff is like the Inca, you know, which was the 1500s, 14 to 1500s, versus you know, 2500, 2700 BC for the Egyptians. Those are the the mainstream dating. And and this it isn't just in these two places. I mean, we see this on Easter Island. We see it in Turkey. We see it in Lebanon. You see a style, I mean, it, there's, it's theorized and certainly there's debatable sites in, even, you know, in Russia and, and uh, New Zealand and all around the world, there's, there's people that try to look at this and say, is this the remnants of this type of construction? Because, I mean, it, over time, this will actually eventually fall apart if the ground shifts or earthquakes happen. Uh, it's, and it, it's, it's a, I think it's a tremendous indicator of, of some, yeah, global connection. This might be an indicator for a, a civilization that was potentially globe spanning. I certainly, if, if I think about what an ancient civilization, a lost ancient civilization that had high tech capabilities able to do this sort of work with ease, I mean, I do think it was globe spanning. It, it may have had different offshoots and there's, there's nuance and detail in all of this. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a tremendous indicator. And this isn't work that you typically see done in, in later periods. One of the explanations for like, well, why this happens, and that this is one you get from, from mainstream, I guess, or archaeologists, and it's this concept that, well, they were solving the same problem. It's like, okay, we, we know that if, if you're trying to figure out how to make a spear point, right, you, you're probably going to nap stone and, and, and get to a similar result. You might have different techniques. And indeed, that is how we, 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 distinct, we, we make distinctions between like Clovis cultures and later, uh, you know, Indigenous American, Native American cultures. Then you might get into the same place. But literally, if you're trying to build a wall <laughs> or a structure, it's tough for me to believe that that independently different cultures came up with 
pretty much the hardest and most challenging way to do that mm. imaginable. Like we right. don't build like this today because it's insanely difficult. Right. Like not only is this uh what what's the explanation for how they could even build something? I, like look, that? I I I don't know. They they literally and the, the funny thing about South America in particular is that um is that uh it's it's you know it's just like a 150 year period that supposedly all of this happened in. You have multiple styles there. And again, this is mortalist joints. And in, in places in South America, in, in particularly in the streets of Cusco, you can also see this at Sacsayhuaman, which is one of the sites around Cusco in Peru. Uh, and you can kind of see it up here in this corner. You, you see this where the walls sort of come apart. Mm -hmm. You see that nice, sharp line. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing is, is the outside surface, the front surface is a little rougher. Perhaps it was more polished in the past, but you can pretty clearly see how perfectly well made those inside surfaces are the joining surfaces, the 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 mating surfaces between the stones, and we're not talking about straight lines here. Like this is not like it's ninety degree, you know, straight lines with ninety degree corners. These things are curved. They 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 match through the full depth of the stone. Like these are perfectly matched mating surfaces. I I, I it's a real mystery to me as to how you do this because any conventional means would involve a process of, you know, particularly a Bronze Age or a primitive, relatively primitive culture, you know, grinding on this stone. You're somehow lifting up these 20 or 50 or 100 ton blocks and, okay, just check it out, you know, Johnson and put a bit of chalk on it where it lands and then, okay, grind that spot down and have this slow process. I, I just don't think that's a feasible answer. I don't know how it was done. There's certainly plenty of evidence uh, for things like machining, uh, particularly in Egypt, but also in South America. Uh, machining and other sort of powerful tools that have been used to um, to shape the stone. I, I legitimately believe that's a possibility, and I think we see plenty of strong evidence for it. Uh, there may it may it may extend to realms of like, well, they had some technique of working the stone that we don't understand. It might. I actually do think it's a legitimate possibility that some of these answers might be outside of our current scope or knowledge of technology, which is one of the reasons why I think we should be open minded about it. Because I think if we study it, we might actually end up learning something. Right. Uh, yeah, it looks like there's, you know, it looks like two different technologies. It looks like you've got a base layer and we know this happens today when humans come into oh, yeah. a, an old area, we just build right on top of it. It, it certainly a, yeah. appears that, you know, that's what's happening here. You've got this highly sophisticated stonework at the bottom and then <laughs> you have yeah, the rocks perfect. on top. Right. You just yeah. throw some rocks on top with yeah. the next civilization. Yeah. This is Alante Tambo. Um, which is not to be overlooked. You have to catch the, if you want to go to Machu Picchu, you go through to the, from the train at Lante Tambo, but don't miss visiting Lante Tambo itself. One of the best sites for this evidence and this layering. And this in fact is the same thing that we see in Egypt, but it's very pronounced in South America, which is the, the highest technology, the most sophisticated, largest stonework is the, is at the bottom. Like it's literally in, in South America, it's, it's clear as day. Once you see it, there's, in fact, there's three, uh, different layers and they have these terms it's uh, terms that come from a, a guy named jesus gamara and his father who've been studying the sacred valley region for like 60 70 years now um there's essentially this the, the bottom layer is is what you they call hanan pacha which is the monolithic work so it's like the living mountain and you see in, in a lot of places i probably have some examples of of hanan pacha here this is hanan pacha so it's where it's it's not cellular it's 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 this it's this like carving into the you know the the living rock of the mountain itself, and and some places it's very strange. It's flowing, it's shaped, it's carved. Some places it looks more precise, like this, where they're going for some particular effect. Uh, this was a, at a, a site called Napahuaca, which is not rarely seen, um, not really part of the regular tourist uh, pathway. This was uh, destroyed, as many things were by the Spanish, um, thinking that there might have been gold inside it or something. It was blown apart. Uh, this is always at the bottom layer, and then that's followed by what what they call Uran Pacha, which is the cellular megalithic work that we just saw, streets of Cusco, Sacsayhuaman, and it's these huge, precise blocks of stone that are that are locked together in intricate patterns. Um, not always curved, sometimes quite linear. The 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 Cori in the in the center of Cusco is a great example of megalithic art, architecture that really matches what you see in Egypt. Uh, and then on top of that is is what we saw before, uh, what they would call the uh, the uh, I think it's ink, Inkupacha, which is the uh, the Inca work. Um, where was that picture here? This thing. So it's and there's it literally this huge gap, and you always see this work on top. It's loose stone. It's mm -hmm. local stone, often with mud mortar, 
um, where, whereas you see the megalithic work is often made of a single type of stone that, that will have a quarry that's miles away. And we're talking about miles over mountains at altitude with rivers and valleys between them. And there's this huge jump up to then what, what we think was happening, what I'd postulate and many other people do too, is that the Inca were, they found these abandoned megalithic sites when they, when they came into the Sacred Valley and they were rebuilding them. And there's plenty of evidence for that. Even the Spanish saw them trying to do that when they came in. These guys were trying to move some big stones around and failing in some cases. And you see that in process where they've tried to put the jigsaw puzzle back together. And if they couldn't, they would often take one of these stones and they would use them in their own building. They'd put them as a lentil over a doorway. And it's just this one megalithic stone embedded in this wall of like just sort of, you know, just regular random stonework that's put together with mud mortar that would very much match the capabilities of a civilization like the Inca. And on these megalithic sites, they've been repairing them. You see this, it's clear as day, it's Saxe one one and Alante Tambo. You see these later layers, yet, you know, kind of the, the, the orthodox explanation for this is, well, the Inca did all of this. They did mm -hmm. all three styles and they did it all within a 150 year period that was essentially the length of their civilization. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make any Nothing sense. came before them. And no. yeah, well, there's, there is some, <laughs> oh, they talk about some people that came before them, but it generally the buildings attributed to the Inca, the sites okay. are Inca sites. But okay. yeah, I, I think it's complete nonsense and it's clear as day uh, in, uh, in South America. Let's talk about the Sphinx for a couple minutes. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I'd love to get into that with you a little bit and get your thoughts on that. You know, I know Robert Schock has done some incredible work on that with the yes. erosion on the Temple of the Sphinx and... Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, talk to me a little bit about, you know, um, what, what is some of the evidence that the Sphinx is a much older, uh, monument? Uh, well, the Sphinx is, I mean, it's fascinating. It's one of the, I love, yeah, I love that monument. I've, been, I've had the chance to be down in, in the enclosure a couple of times, get up close to it. Um, so there's, there's, I think there's, there's several different lines of evidence and, and ways of thinking about the Sphinx that sort of point towards that one one is obviously the fact that it seems likely that its head has been recarved right anyone that looks at it and sees it you'll notice the head's kind of out of proportion to the body it's a little small relative to the body the dynastic egyptians were masters of proportion and sculpture they made beautiful works of art this wouldn't have been a deliberate choice by them but perhaps it's the result of them recarving the head you know, and it may have been something else. A lot of people have theorized that maybe the head was that of a lion. And so there's astronomical evidence when you look at it, it's facing east, so facing the sunrise. And if in, there's a, people may or may not know about the, the, the great year or the concept of precession, the precession of the equinoxes, right? So it's one of the many cycles of the Milankovitch cycles that the planet goes through. But but where the sun rises on the on the uh, the, the summer solstice, you know, we we're it's under which constellation defines what age we're in. So today we're in the age of Pisces. So generally, you know, when the sun rises on that on that solstice, it's okay. We're we're under Pisces. We're slowly moving into the age of Aquarius. It actually it's a precession of the equinox. It goes back backwards through the constellations, and it's a funny study that whole area of the zodiac that goes back through time and culture it's very common it, it goes all the way back to the ancient egyptians in fact it's well documented in ancient egypt the zodiacs all over the um all over the the temple of dendera a very famous uh, version of a stone of the zodiac it's actually housed in the louvre today but not only in in at the dendera in that one area but it's actually plastered all along the, the tops of these amazing all entirely dynastic uh, temples so they were well aware of this so I guess they got the idea from somewhere. But so some people have theorized that, that perhaps, the, you know, if the lion was, if it was a lion and it was pointing uh, due east and perhaps the constellation under which that it, it, it may have been aiming at might have been Leo, the lion, which is a, sim, a, sim, it's a, it's a connection between that constellation and, and a lion that's been in place for a long time. And again, this strange thing with the zodiac, it does have these correlations between cultures and time. Then perhaps that indicates an age of around 10,000 to 12,000 years ago uh, because the yeah, procession the of the equinoxes is 26,000 year cycle. So each age is like two and a half thousand years. Roughly some constellations are wider than others. So that's one, that's one uh, potential avenue for ev of evidence that suggests, well, if it was a line and maybe it's a, a marker to, to potentially indicate, hey, I was built to symbolize the age of Leo. At least in the last processional cycle, it, it could actually be you go back 10,000 years or 12, to, to 10 or 12,000 years to that period of time, like say 10,000 BC, uh, 
you know, it could be 26 and a half thousand years older than that. We don't know. Like each processional cycle is, is 26, um, roughly 26,000 years, a little more. Uh, the other one that's probably more well known that's been the debate that you mentioned, Robert Schock, and we should also remember the great John Anthony West, who kind of theorized this idea in the first place and then invited Robert Schock, who's a, a professor of professor of geology uh, from Boston University. So a real expert when it comes to the sort of topics that we'll get into is the erosion that is shown in on the Sphinx, not only on the Sphinx, but probably more importantly, the, the Sphinx enclosure. So for people that don't know. Do you have any pictures of that? Do I have the Sphinx? If I, not, we can always add this back up after. Yeah, we... I don't actually. I, okay. Unless I have it under pyramid stuff. Probably not. Uh, no, unfortunately. Um, okay. So the Sphinx is, is not a, like they didn't build it. It's carved from the bedrock. Mm -hmm. It's actually the remnants of what you would call a yardang, which is like a limestone outcrop. But in order to carve it, they actually cut down into the bedrock. They, they created this enclosure. And in fact, a lot of the blocks that seem to have been part of like the, the Valley Temple, the big, there's actually like blocks like 150, 200 tons. They've come from the Sphinx enclosure. They carved down and then they carved along and then they shaped it from the actual bedrock. So it's not built so much as carved from the bedrock. Uh, the Sphinx has been repaired over time, right? So, so there's actually evidence for old kingdom repairs, and there's a there's a stone, the, the Khufu's daughter's stone, or it was also sometimes known as the um, the inventory stelae, that gets dismissed as a hoax, as 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 uh, false news, I guess, by uh, by this, a lot of Egyptologists, because it talks of Khufu, because they're going to remember that this, the Sphinx is attributed to Khafra, right? Khafra of the Middle Pyramid Complex, who was the son of Khufu. Khufu is the Great Pyramid. This is the orthodox dating for it. The people like to attribute the Sphinx to, to Khafra because it seems to be part of that Middle Pyramid Complex, which more or less gets associated to Khafra. There's actually very little evidence to support this. It doesn't matter. But there's a, there, I just want to say there is a later stele the stele of Khufu's daughter, they call it, and uh, and it also called the inventory stele that, that talks about Khafra, uh, sorry, Khufu, uh, so Khafra's father, making repairs to the Sphinx. So before it was even built, apparently Khufu was repairing it. And there's some evidence for Old Kingdom repairs on the body of the Sphinx. Then there's later, like Thutmosis IV repaired it, and then the Romans repaired it, and it's been repaired in the industrial age, it's been repaired in the modern age. So, so they're repairing it how close to after the time that it was built? We, I don't know when it was built, but this yep. this is this is actually an account of it being repaired before it was supposed to have been built. Uh, okay, so <laughs> so I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense. If yeah. I was an easy toller, I'd probably go, yeah, that's that's that's, yeah. that's nonsense. Um, yeah. But it's it's I think it's more of an indication of yeah, that, and and there is actually on the body of it, you look like it, it. There is what I think is old kingdom repair work. You can still see it. Mm -hmm. It matches other old kingdom repair work. So. If it was built in the old kingdom, why are you repairing it right. straight away? Like, right. what's the point? And yeah. I think it's older. I think there's tremendous evidence. I, in fact, think the entire middle pyramid complex is older. I think that may even be the oldest uh, structure there. But mm -hmm. so, what my point is that you can't use the body of the Sphinx to really determine things like erosion. Now, a, the nice thing about the enclosure is that nobody's really done anything to the enclosure. They've carved a few caves into it here and there. But the walls of the enclosure essentially haven't been touched. They haven't been repaired. There actually have been some fissures repaired here and there, but in general, it's it's pretty original. So what's interesting about it is, is that you can look at the patterns on the walls of the Sphinx enclosure and determine things like erosion. And Robert Schock came along and looked at it as an expert geologist and said, that's rainfall erosion. Like these vertical fissures that you see. Um, you see these horizontal fissures in, uh, in, the, in the walls, but that's more to do with the different layers of limestone, it's a sedimentary rock, so it gets laid down in layers, and some layers are harder than others, so it erodes at different rates, leaves these you know, horizontal striations over time. But there are vertical fissures on the wall too, and he's like, that's rainfall erosion. Now, everybody knows Egypt's a bit of a desert. <laughs> I mean, I've seen it rain there. It's, it's infrequent. But in order to get that type of erosion on those walls, you're talking about thousands of years of quite heavy rainfall. Mm -hmm. And you have to go back to periods of time, like 9,000 years ago and more, when Egypt was green and verdant and more tropical, and there was rain. And, but you have to go back even further because it takes thousands of years of rain to get that type of erosion. Now, there's, of course, there's lots of debate about this and argument because it's a, it upsets the apple cart uh, about the story of history. But it's tough to argue with. If, if, you just, if you ever took a picture of 
you know, I define take a picture of that rain of of that section of the wall of, of limestone. With remove the context. Don't tell anyone that this is Egypt or the Sphinx enclosure. And show it to a your geologist. Nine times out of ten, probably more, they're going to say, "Well, that's rainfall erosion on limestone." So there's all sorts of wacky ideas and 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 debates that people are trying to use to justify other explanations. Things like they a lot of times I like to say, "Well, it's wind and sand erosion." See, it's sand and wind and I often I I hate this argument because for one, you give the Sphinx ten years, fifteen years, without it being maintained, the thing fills up to its chest in sand. Like the the, the enclosure gets buried very mm. quickly. This has happened time and time again in our records. We have tons of you go back look at old photos of the Sphinx buried up to here, and it's literally happened between excavations. Like there's been excavations. Someone finishes, they clear it all out, and then 10 years later, the next guy comes in and goes, oh, I've got a year of work trying to clear all this yeah. sand out again because yeah. it just fills up. It happened during the dynastic. The Romans had to dig it out. You know, Thutmosis IV had to dig it out. That's the whole dream stele that's between the legs of the Sphinx. It tells the story of Thutmosis IV who fell asleep in the shadow of the Sphinx and he and had a dream, and the Sphinx said, hey, dig me up and you'll become king. Like, clean me off, you know? Yeah. So it's, and, but the one part, what's the one part that doesn't get buried? The head. The head. Right. So do you think that, that w w is there evidence to suggest that the Sphinx head was, was, was the only thing that was sticking out during the time of the Egyptians? Well, I think for, for long periods of time, I'm sure that's what was going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. my, my point about it is, is that if you're saying that it's wind and sand erosion on the, on the enclosure, buried, the part that is always buried, so it must have had enough exposure to, to wind and sand and of course, mainstream Egyptologists, uh, it's the mainstream story, they don't talk about the Sphinx's head being recarved. It's all OG, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And But the part of the Sphinx that is always exposed to wind and sand. It's the head. The head. Do you see any, it, there's no erosion like that on the head. Like, and the head hasn't been, I mean, there's been some modern concrete repair to shore up the neck. But in general, they haven't like been touching up the head. You just don't, it's limestone. You don't see the same erosion on the head. It's, it's, it's this reverse contradiction like reverse logic, this contradiction in the story that is so common uh, when you dig into the details of this mm -hmm. story, and and it's just you just have to sort of dig in a bit and not believe what you what you're told on the in the first account, and you'll you'll easily find these sort of contradictions. That's a big one for me. So, yeah, I think the wind and sand erosion is is a big problem. There's another uh, aspect to this as well that I've actually had a really interesting conversation with Randall Carlson on, where he's he's there's been studies done into rates of limestone erosion. So not only can we look at the rainfall erosion, but we can actually look at the rates of erosion in the walls themselves, which we know are generally original. And there's been many, many studies done into this from for the last 80, 90 years where they've looked at limestone on coasts that are affected by wave action, limestone under all sorts of different circumstances, alkaline, acidic environments, all this sort of stuff. So you can take those studies and apply what we see to the walls of the Sphinx enclosure. And once again, you come back with figures that are like, Damn, this might be 50,000 years old, like just looking at the erosional patterns. Um, so there's a ton of evidence that suggests the Sphinx is, is much older. Um, yep, yep yeah. for sure. Very fascinating. Thank you. The pyramids. Let's talk about those <laughs> for just a couple of minutes. You can't sure. get you all the way down here without talking about the pyramids. Oh, no worries. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the... Um, the the mainstream explanation for what the pyramids were, what they were used for, um, essentially tombs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, talk to me a little bit about that. What what's the what's the explanation for the pyramids, and what are your thoughts on what they might represent? Well, they they are typically described as tombs. Most people probably know the pyramids as tombs. Uh, most people may also be surprised that there's almost no evidence that supports the idea that they're tombs. There's Certainly, the large stone pyramids that we're familiar with have ne there's ne they've never found any mummies or burials inside of these um, inside of these pyramids. No mummies ever found in a pyramid. Not in not in not in the big stone ones. Yeah, they've certainly yeah. found burials in other pyramids, um, and in some cases, it's not they're not original burials where they some other pyramids may have been used as places to bury stuff. As it comes back to this renovation and reuse concept. Yeah. Uh, that that we that we know of um there's we we kind of i often talk about the stone pyramids that are, like giza plateau the great pyramid the the khufu pyramid or kafra pyramid the middle pyramid and then menkara pyramid which is the small third one uh you can get inside them in fact i've been inside of all three a few times 
sometimes one of them is closed uh, when the other ones aren't. They're, they're attributed to the Old Kingdom, right? The Fourth Dynasty, essentially. Okay. We have plenty of Fourth Dynasty tombs. We know what they look like. Uh, they're beautiful. Like the, the Valley of the Kings is, if you've been there, I mean, it's the gorgeous artwork. I mean, they're later period tombs, but the Old Kingdom tombs look similar. They, they're, they're full of inscriptions and life and stories about the afterlife and statues, carvings, you know, all of the things that these people would need to take into the afterlife with them. You don't see any of that inside of these pyramids. They're bare. Like there's no inscriptions, no glyphs, no... No, no hieroglyphs found in the... In the, yeah. the well, <laughs> is there... <laughs> it's, that's a... That's a there's, there is a... There is a... There's supposedly a glyph inside the Great Pyramid in one of the chambers above the King's Chamber. That's also a long story. I, 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 I am very suspicious and skeptical uh, about the origin of that glyph. There's been a lot of controversy around it. Uh, supposedly, it's a, it's, a, it's a glyph that says the Gangs of Khufu uh, that was written on a stone, that, that granite beam that's in one of these chambers. They're often called relieving chambers that, that are stacked up above the, um, the so-called King's Chamber. Uh, so if, I mean, we can dive into it if you like, but there, there is a lot of controversy around that glyph. Like uh, it's, uh, I think it's red ochre. It's it's been painted. It's definitely there. There's a there is a a painting on that rock. But I uh, I would very well all I would say is I would very much like to have the red ochre paint carbon dated. Mm -hmm. It can be. It's organic. I suspect it has been. <laughs> so so you question whether or not the Egyptians have actually even been inside the pyramids. I, well, I think it's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, so long story short, I think Howard Weiss, who was one of the early explorers, uh, may well have been responsible for that glyph. There's been whole books written about that glyph, and there's been quite a bit of controversy in recent years. Because it's the only one that's ever been found. Yeah, it's, it's, it. it's the only one inside any pyramid. So and they graffitied a lot of stuff. Well, they did, but it's more. I th I'm not even. I don't think it was the Egyptians. If they did it, I suspect it was Howard Colonel Howard Weiss, mm -hmm. who at the time. Uh, so the long story short is 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 he was uh, one of the early explorers prior to Petrie getting into the. I think he could get into the pyramid for quite a long time. I mean, we know it was open supposedly by the Caliph Al Mamun. I think around 400 AD. It might have been. I think I'm way off on that. It might be 1100, but it's been hundreds of years. You could tourists could get in and out of it. And he was looking. He was looking for investment. He was running out of money, vice was for his expeditions, and he needed to make a discovery. And he had some person of means. I think it was like a duchess or something like this, or I don't know, some rich um, patron was coming along, and just at the right time, miraculously, is when he, hey, I've discovered this glyph up here, and that actually had the intended effect. He got more investment and got to continue his, his excavations. Uh, I, 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 I think that it should be carbon dated. I, I think it's too convenient that he found that at the right time. I think is it, I think it's a high likelihood that he probably put that on there. There are issues with the style and form of it. There's all sorts of really little weird things about the, the Khufu glyph. Um, I just think it should be tested. Uh, I suspect it has been because there's definitely been some paint taken from it. You know, if 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 one if you're going to find one in there, you would think that you would have found more than just one. <laughs> right. You, know, you would think there'd be something. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's glyphs. Yeah. We we see like the point is we see all the other tombs with other glyphs. We know what tombs look like, and there's there's literally the other pyramids that are completely bare. The other stone pyramids uh, at at Giza. There's nothing in there, and they're not they're not tombs. Like this this idea that ah oh, like, cuz there's multiple chambers speaking in the great pyramid you have a subterranean chamber you have what they call a queen's chamber and then they have the king's chamber at the end of the grand gallery uh there's people may be aware of the scan pyramids project that's discovered there's another large void above the grand gallery that's 40 meters long and 4 meters uh, wide and 4 meters tall that they've found through muon uh detection like cosmic ray detection incredible stuff uh it's this idea that the way they explain this, and this is like literally one of the most complex and precisely made structures the planet's ever seen. It was the tallest, it was the tallest building on Earth until the Eiffel Tower was constructed. I mean, it's an incredible feat of engineering, not something you make up as you go along, yet that's the explanation for it. It's like, he, well, no, you know what? He wanted, they, he wanted this chamber here first, and he said, yeah, mm, I don't want that middle chamber. You know what? Build me another chamber up here, and they just sort of made it up as they went along. So he changed his mind changed as to where mind. he wanted to be buried. That's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, it's an, to be fair, Khufu, that's an improvement on Sneferu, who's okay. the, the first pharaoh of the old kingdom of the fourth dynasty, who had three whole pyramids built to be buried in, apparently. 
Like you literally have the, the, some of the three largest and most amazing structures on the planet. It's the, the Maidum Pyramid, the Red Pyramid, and the Bent Pyramid, all attributed to one pharaoh. How many do you need to be buried into? You know, these are all, but they're all his tomb. That's the story. That's, That's the, the mainstream story. story. Wow. Yeah. And not to mention that I think, you know, it, it, the idea that they built three of these gigantic pyramids. In fact, I have, I have a slide here just for this. These three pyramids are all from Sneferu, the Red Pyramid, the Bent Pyramid, the Mardum Pyramid. It's more than three and a half million tons of stone. If he ruled for 25 years, it requires more than 380 tons of stone, uh, 380 tons of stone installed every single day wow. for him to even do that. So there's logistical challenges. There's huge problems with the whole pyramid timeline. There's no evidence that they were tombs. There's no mummies been found in there. There's no inscriptions. Uh, you know, there's very little evidence even linking these rulers to these to these to these tombs. In fact, there's a it's like a five or six inch statue of Kuf, of Khufu that was found in the Valley Temple, which apparently didn't even exist at the time when he was building his uh, his structure. That's where they found that statue, and then somehow through that they've linked that pyramid to him. So hmm. that. Yeah. Now, do you have now, do we do we have evidence of pyramids that the Egyptians that we're, we're positive the Egyptians built these pyramids and and how does that construction compare to what we see with some of the more impressive structures? Yes. So I think we do. The pyramids they, they did continue or they were building pyramids that the Egyptians made uh, mud brick pyramids. So so can, typically you can find at places like Hawara, um, Lahoon. There's a lot of different areas that in fact it was like a a thousand till about a thousand years after the old kingdom they were they were still building pyramids much smaller less grandiose and typically made from mud brick and in fact the only scene on a wall which egyptians were fond of 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 drawing out and we get a lot of information from these amazing scenes on walls uh, is like, that's like i mean that describes pyramid building is actually in the a place called the tomb of the nobles which is on the west bank um, of the nile in luxor one of these tombs that actually shows a scene of pyramid building. And, but what they're doing is they're baking mud bricks and they're taking these mud bricks and they're stacking them up. And you see plenty of evidence for that. Uh, you know, there, there are pyramids with writing on them. For example, there's a, there's a very well-known pyramid uh, at Saqqara. It's the uh, Winis Pyramid or UN spelled U-N-A-S, Winis. Uh, and that's the famous pyramid texts. So this is actually, you go into this and it is a stone pyramid. It's wonderfully, it's a smaller pyramid megalithic you go in there and the walls in the inner chambers are entirely plastered over and written so i i think what's happened here is this this may well be a megalithic structure that may well be more ancient there's a giant stone box in there that's been precision made and then they've plastered over the walls which was very common and then they've carved this intricate um you know set of hieroglyphs on there it's actually beautiful in there and i mean that we've gotten we've learned a lot about their the book of the dead and all these other things from the pyramid texts uh, but i don't i don't correlate the drawing of those glyphs as being contemporary necessarily with the structure itself you can plaster over walls and and paint on them it, it might be a, a reuse we certainly see plenty of evidence for reuse of these places as burials in later times i mean you find these big boxes i mean there's so many times we've opened up some of these so-called sarcophagi and you find you know burials inside them that are thousands of years later than the site was supposedly built, which means somebody came along and said, you know, this is a ceremonial site. Maybe we'll, we'll use it as such. I, I think that's exactly what um, happened. If you, if, you, if you consider the idea that, all right, maybe the dynastic Egyptians inherited works, they inherited architecture and artifacts. They had cultural memories of their ancestors. In fact, this is what they say. The, the, the Egyptian origin story is pretty specific about how far back it goes. It's like some 36,420 years or something. They describe different periods of time, the Zepta time of Zeptepi, when the gods themselves walked to the earth. And some of these, these rulers ruled for hundreds of years or thousands of years. Then they had the, the period of, that was known as the Shemsu Hor or the followers of Horus. And these were semi-divine god kings as well that had mag magical, mystical powers. And then after that is when the dynastic history kind of starts. But they, they correlate it together. So I think it's a pretty clear indication that they had a cultural memory of their ancestors. I think their ancestors were a bit more advanced. This is certainly what they tell in a lot of their other stories, their cataclysm stories. And uh, they were wiped out. They were pushed back to like essentially hunter-gatherer existence. 
And then when they get organized enough to kick off the new civilization, they've got these artifacts, they've got this architecture, and but they, they have a memory of this technology. And what does it become? It's magic. We talked about this before with, with our civilization. So how do you capture that significance or that magic? You do it through ceremony, like you dance around the fire. That's the most simple version of it. But this becomes more complex now, it's, and this is a, a place for worship and ceremony. So this is a, one of the reasons why I think every site you go to is described as, oh, it's never functional, <laughs> it's always ceremonial. Like sure. Every place is, oh, this is ceremonial. The reason they did this is because it was ceremonial. I think a lot of those sites were used that way in later periods. That's what I think is going on here. He says so some of these pyramids, some of these courtyards, some of these structures became these mystical objects that became ceremonial. And throughout the thousands of years, the hubris and arrogance of kings may have led them to eventually try to capture that for themselves by writing their names on it, mm. by claiming it and saying, now, I, I mean, I am, I am amongst the gods. And this is one consistent thing. When you look in these Egyptian tombs and you... You look on these artifacts, the way that pharaohs are depicted from the Old Kingdom to the Ptolemaic times, over 3,000 years, it's pretty consistent. The, the iconography of the ancient Egyptian, the, the iconic look that we know, and how they're depicted, they're always drawn as being amongst the gods. These were god kings, and that's how they wanted to seem. So if you are sitting on a, you know, your culture starts with a, you know, <laughs> thousand ton statue and you have a thousand ton statue of a, a precisely made out of granite or, or composite quartzite or something which we know several of these existed probably were could only have been made with significantly advanced technology i mean i think that's the iconography that you go for like i this is a depiction of a god it's it's literally your god is is cast in stone in front of you and your culture and your ancestors and that becomes your iconography you claim that for yourself it's it's a question I've gotten a lot, which is like if well if I think that these some of these statues not all of them but some of them are, are so old and older than the dynastic Egyptians how come they look like dynastic Egyptians I actually think it's the the other way around like I, I think dynastic Egyptians look like this because they inherited so much and what we're looking at are depictions of the builder culture whatever whoever was responsible it's their artwork it's their iconography then mimicked and reused and claimed by later kings. So with pyramids, I think there's a good chance, particularly the Great Pyramid, that potentially the dynastic Egyptians may not have even been able to get in there. So I think if they had, we might see some more evidence for it because certainly in the ones where they, they did, there's evidence for it. They would do things inside there and we, they'd leave their mark and kings would eventually claim it. It's, I think it's potential that they didn't because back in the day, I mean, the pyramid as we know it was, I mean, which sort of looks a bit rough on the outside now, but it was cased in fine white Tura limestone that, mm -hmm. that had, you know, really no perceivable joins. Like it would have been this giant white triangle with no door and, you know, you know, this like, you know, three, four feet thick limestone tiles that weigh like five, six tons mm -hmm. that are interlocked together that you can't pry out. I mean, it wasn't until there was a massive earthquake I think this is the 400 something AD date that, that, that shook loose a few of those stones. And then that's what began the quarrying operation. Like it wasn't until an earthquake shook loose some of these stones that then there were people that could get in there and start to pry off okay. the casing stones. Okay. And they tumble down. And this is, you know, it, it, that's a, that fine white limestone is a very valuable substance because you can grind it up and make plaster. Um, it, it, and the fun fact the pyramids have eight sides. Uh, that well, apparently, yeah. This is yeah. they seem to have eight sides. When you look at it under, there's a couple of days in the in the year, I think, where the shadows cast just right, where where you can see that it uh, they do indeed. There is a dip in between the each each side of it that seems to have been engineered. It's it's at the equinox, I think. I think right? so. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah and cast shadows. Okay. Yeah, and maybe my last question about the pyramids, <clears throat> and we can take a little break. Yeah. Is the there's apparently uh, granite, huge granite slabs that are above the king's chamber that that are I don't know how many, fifty of them that weigh something like seventy tons each, and and so that's that's got to be a couple hundred feet up in the air. Oh, what what's the explanation for how uh, how the Egyptians would have gotten those 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 megalithic stones up there and placed them so perfectly? 
That's a very good point. Yes. So that there is, while the the Great Pyramid itself is is the superstructures built from limestone, which I think is about I think it's pretty close, like two point two tons per cubic meter, and I think granite's about two point seven tons, something like that. Mm -hmm. I need to probably remember those numbers. Um, yeah, there, there is there's a huge number of what you call these granite ashlars that, that are above the king's chamber and they're stacked up in these little chambers. And yeah, they're all, some of them 70, 80 tons. It's insane. It's not just the king's chamber, but all these chambers above it. And it's I don't know how you explain how they got those things up there. I, I've not heard an adequate explanation for it because not only uh, are we talking about you know the king's chamber like where it is in the superstructure of the pyramid like you, you you know a couple hundred feet off the ground relative to the ground that the pyramid sits on but the, the people don't realize that the Giza plateau is a slope like it the pyramid's on a high spot of the plateau so it is actually you've got to get them all the way up to the pyramid in the first place and then somehow lift them up and precisely shape them and fit them together because this is again another example of this incredible you know megalithic mortalist architecture if, you go, if you've ever been in the king's chamber like it's just breathtaking work like the, the way these these pieces all fit together but i don't know how they got them up there yeah. because that's the other aspect i mean it's not like this granite came from anywhere nearby uh most of it came from a place called aswan which is in upper egypt in the south Giza's in lower egypt it's 500 miles away um so you had to get this stuff quarried 500 and, and miles they didn't away. have the wheel is that correct they, they, <laughs> so well, it's not like they put it on a on a uh you know on a on a car and drove it down right um, yeah so well this is one of more this is again you're uncovering some of the many contradictions when you dig into the, the this story is not only do they not did they not have the wheel uh many egyptologists don't credit the old kingdom egyptians with the ability to quarry granite wow right it's 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 mind-bogglingly weird that they don't. It's, I mean, I won't say all. There are some that are like, well, obviously they could because they're using this granite, but there's no evidence for them having the ability or the tool, and tools and technology to quarry granite. Yet, old kingdom structures are replete in these huge granite lumps, and it's not only, it's and it, there's all sorts of geological implications with this because they they would say, well, the people that say, well, they couldn't quarry granite, they would use what they'd call surface granite. To make these pieces now if you've ever seen granite outcrops i mean on the surface of stuff there's some big chunks here and there but a lot of it's flaking apart uh it's very difficult to imagine that you could find a piece big enough that you could shape a single you know 70 ton block out of it without it having defects and cracking and falling apart but when you actually look at the stone and this is true of a lot of the granite in the pyramid plus uh in the the middle pyramid structure the mortuary temple huge quartz crystal inclusions like like much and this is would make it a much tougher material to work and this would like for kitchen counter purposes you probably it'd be a difficult stone to work but you don't get that type of stone that high quality large crystal inclusions from surface level granite you have to dig it out from 10 15 meters inside a granite outcropping go down that deep uh, we saw they would do that in the quarries they had these things called test pits where they were probably testing the quality of the granite to find out all right is this the stuff that we need down here. So we'll dig all the way down and get this big piece out because that's going to be solid enough where it doesn't have defects. It's not going to like crack and snap in half. Um, so they couldn't quarry. They didn't have the wheel. And there's no evidence of that. They use sleds and things to drag granite around. So presumably they quarry it on the in the south, which is, and then they would use the Nile. They would ship the stuff up to the okay. north, like upstream, or sorry, downstream because the Nile flows south to north. It's higher in the south, therefore upper Egypt, lower in the north, lower Egypt. And then ship the stuff up to the pyramid. But there's, again, there's, there's, there's problems with that theory too, uh, in that they would presumably do this during the three-month inundation of the Nile when there was enough water in the Nile to get the boats to the quarry at Aswan and then also get the boats to what was a presumably a harbour uh, at Giza. Do we have evidence for boats, for Egyptian boats? Were we do. They, and, and, and well. How? We we certainly do. There's there's a there was a, a quite a large boat um, discovered at uh, with the, in a boat pit around the around the pyramid, uh, dynastic Egyptian boat. I mean, I think pretty sure it's been carbon dated. Uh, for sure, it was buried there by the dynastic Egyptians. And in fact, they they beautifully reconstructed it. There was for the longest time a, a boathouse next to the pyramid. They've since relocated all that to the new Grand Egyptian Museum. Uh, I've been in the boathouse. It was cool. They 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 built bigger boats than the Vikings did. And 
It's one of the other reasons they were. De- I think the dynastic Egyptians were seafarers. There's lots of evidence for it. I think they ended up in Australia. I, I think the Gosford glyphs are legitimate. That's a whole other story. But um, you know, they were a culture that spread out and and definitely were familiar with boats. There's no real evidence for the size of boat that would be required to okay. re- to transport some of the granite pieces. And I think there's a huge problem here as well because. You know, some of, we've been talking about granite artifacts, like the the stones that are in the Great Pyramid, like 70, 80 tons. It's a significant challenge. It's a, it's a big, massive amount of weight, but it by no means stops there. I mean, there's evidence for single piece granite artifacts that exceed a thousand tons oh. uh, in dynastic Egypt. In fact, there was evidence for a single piece statue. So that's two million pounds. Yeah, thousand tons. Yeah. Yeah. Two million pounds. There is there is a statue at a place called Tanis, which is even further north. You're talking about a thousand miles from the quarry for this stone in Aswan. And this statue, you consider the size of the Statue of Liberty, not with the pedestal, just the, the lady herself, about the same size. Wow. Her, the big toe on this statue is about the same size as the big toe <laughs> on the Statue of Liberty, but made from single a single solid piece of granite and perfectly made. And there's the evidence for that statue is at a place called Tanis. So that block, and they, we know they didn't ship stuff finished. So that block may well have been 12, 1,500 tons. We don't know. Mm. But how do you ship? How do you move a piece of stone that big? You can't get a boat in there. I mean, it's just the, the, the displacement of water. There's nothing uh, in that quarry area that, that comes even close. And, yeah, I, I don't know how you explain it. So, you know, and then you you can only do this presumably three months a year when there's enough water and then trying to fit that into the logistical picture of building the overall structure with, you know, the, the six million tons or whatever it is of, of stone uh, is, is, is a tough, tough ask. I think it was a multi-generational effort to build that pyramid. I don't think it fits the timeline of an individual king. I don't think it's achievable with the tools and techniques of the time. Something else is going on. Like, I think they were built for a different purpose. So with an individual king and how many, st- how many blocks? About two and a half million blocks of stone in the, in the, in the so, Great Pyramid. And so within a king's lifetime, how often would you have to place a block? Well, so the, the math on this is so if you, if you go with the idea of two and a half million blocks of stone, uh, individually they weigh maybe between two and three tons a pop at, on average. Obviously, there's the granite ones in the center that weigh like 60, 70 tons uh, a go. Over a period of, I think, 20 to 25 years, which is, I think, the estimate for Khufu's reign, okay. uh, you would have to have quarried shipped placed and completely finished with a block i think it was i think the math works out to once every one one block every five minutes wow. uh 24 hours a day seven days a week for 20 to 25 years it's in that ballpark so okay. it's to give you an example there's a it was a wonderful story i have used this in my videos so there's a, a quad like a, a literally a, a hole in the ground so, so they had developed the assembly line far before we invented it, apparently. Apparently. Yeah, yeah. They were very efficient. I mean, how yeah. many people, it's like, it's, you know, it's, this is the explanation for it. If you ask, I have literally myself asked Zahi who asked this uh, in, on that tour. And, the, and I've heard him ask this many other times. And the same answer you get is, is like, it was a national project. It's like mm. national, I call it the national project bro answer. Like, because it's just, how did they do it? It was a national, it doesn't matter how much technology, precision. I mean, and this is also one of the most precisely made buildings ever. Mm-hmm. Like insane accuracy in this building, how it's aligned and way that you could spend an hour talking about it. But it, it, the answer is national project. It's okay. it, because they were focused on it. Now, you know, my response to that is often, well, the Apollo missions were a national project for us too, right? Yes, there's a significant amount of the budget goes towards it. We put more resources into it. But it wasn't just a case where we all came together and collectively threw some dudes at the moon. Like it, there was some technology involved. There was right. some other things involved in it. And I think we're looking at the same thing with the, the pyramids. I mean, like I said, there's a hole in the ground in France the, the, about the, the, the volume of the Great Pyramid. And they used dump trucks to dump rubble into it 24 hours a day. It took them 12 years to fill it just by dumping rubble into it wow. and that's to give you an idea of the volume of stone we're talking about yet they're all precisely placed it's planned out there was all sorts of groundwork that had to be done beforehand just just bedrock engineering Ye- probably years of planning years of of bedrock work the whole thing sits on a series of tiles that aren't counted in the in the equation which is 
another amazing topic, the engineering of the Giza Plateau itself. Yeah, it, it's, it's inconceivable that that was built within that time frame using primitive tools, no wheel <laughs> and no quarry. No, right, no right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, the, the story kind of falls apart eventually when you for do it. Sure, yeah. For sure, for sure. Fascinating. Okay, uh, there's a couple more things I want to uh, ask you about, but let's take a quick break and Indeed. we'll come back. All right. All right, awesome. Thanks, Ben. All right, cool. Talking with Ben Van Kirkwick from the Uncharted X channel uh, on YouTube. And um, yeah, we've been talking Egypt. So why don't we finish off in Egypt and then kind of see where we, see where that takes us. Sure. So, you know, I think there's a there's a couple of more things that I wanted to ask you about for sure. And that is the Serapium as one. And hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, there's some debate, but I call it the Serapium. OK. All right. All right perfect. <laughs> Uh, and then the uh, the vases, the stone vases. I'm interested in getting your take on those. But, okay. Yeah. How about some of the precision stonework that we see in the Serapium? Well, one of the, I mean, the Serapium is this interesting site. It's, uh, let's see, I how to best describe the Serapium. It's, it's. I would say it's probably my favorite site if I had to pick one amongst a lot of them. And each, I, I call a lot of sites my favorite. The Serapium was one that it fascinated me initially, probably the most. In fact, one of the earliest. Uh, videos series that I made was was really diving into the Serapium. Uh, so it's it's a it's not a typical so it's not a pyramid site. It's located at a place called Saqqara uh, that has its origins going back to like the earliest times of the uh, the old kingdom. In fact, well and truly before that, uh, it's home to the the other topic that we'll get into the vases as well. Most of them were found in Saqqara, but the Serapium's an an underground series of of tunnels and galleries. In fact, so he, here's an image uh, of of the Serapium. So it's, you know, it's not a, it's by no means a small um, site. In fact, it stretches, I think, some four, 500 feet in one direction. Mm -hmm. uh, there's various tunnels that branch off from it. Uh, these are beautifully well made tunnels in some places, just straight and narrow. You could literally drive a Volkswagen down them. Uh, the site was closed for like some 15 years while they renovated it. And they've done a really nice job. It, it put a wooden floor in there now. Uh, previous to that, if you went in there, you know, the dust would kind of choke you out. It, it would, wouldn't be a very pleasant experience being in there. But what's remarkable about the Serapium is what you find in there. And again, this is one of those um, stories of of uh, of sort of unadorned these crazy granite artifacts. But it's it's home to to twenty four of these just the most gigantic single piece granite boxes uh, in these alcoves that are that are off these galleries. Uh, this is an example of of one of them here. Uh, and they're just these are just marvels of of stonework. They're, they're utterly remarkable. So there's a, a few things to know. I mean, there's a lot to note about these boxes. They're they're gigantic. Let me show you a picture of uh, of uh, of one relative to uh, to to us, I guess. And this is this is one that's tucked away into a corner um, in a closed off limits area. This is uh, this is a huge cyanite or granodiorite box. Uh, as you can see, some of them are like eight feet tall. Probably a little more. Uh, they weigh up to a hundred tons, uh, including the the including lid. Including the lid, okay. Including the lid. Some mm -hmm. of them, I mean, this one, man, the lid's easily thirty tons. Mm -hmm. uh, the box themselves could be 70, 80 tons. Uh, they're just gigantic single pieces of stone. This is one uh, of my buddy Kyle. Wow. Uh, standing on the rim of one of the the rose granite boxes. So these aren't like bolted together. They're made from a, a single piece of stone. So. You quarry out a giant lump of stone, probably 150 plus tons. Uh, you cut it, you cut the lid off it. So the, the boxes, the lids and the boxes are made from the same stone. They're not all the same type of stone. They're all generally uh, very hard stone. So there's, 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 I think, two rose granite boxes that we think the source for that stone was, was likely Aswan, the same quarry we talked about earlier. That's the okay. source for rose granite. But most of the others are like cyanide or granodiorite. It's like a black colored stone, a reddish red granite and we don't really know where the quarries for those were i think a lot of them uh there's a, a place in the the uh the western desert called the wadi hamamet quarry the interesting thing about these other types of stone is that, that the quarries at least the ones that we know about aren't anywhere near the river they're, they're nowhere near the river system so now you're trying you're talking about not just shipping it on a boat but transporting a potential multi hundred ton block of stone over landscape like mm. valleys and mountains and deserts and things like this but they've been brought into this place, and and uh, as I said, they're single piece, right? So there was, um, and they're just they're made with remarkable precision. So 
uh, here's a here's a good example of some of the precision that we see uh, inside the boxes and and in in their formation. So in on the left hand image here, I'm actually standing on the lid of one of these boxes, and you can see looking down into the they let you climb all over them. Well, they, uh, <laughs> yes. they don't really yeah. do that, but it's, <laughs> we have our moments. I've been in the Serapium yeah. probably a dozen times now, so okay. From time to time, we we get the opportunity to go inside yeah. uh, here and there. Generally, not if you visit the Serapium, they're not going to really let you do it. Um, that if you get a quiet moment, you want to pay a keeper some money, he might let you do it. Look, it's people like, oh, what are you doing? Stand on the thing. Like, it's granite. It's a yeah. hundred tons. Right. I'm not going to hurt it. Right. It's right. okay. Right. Like if I fall and bang my head on it, it'll it'll win. Right. Uh, in fact, and these are just the, the construction is a marvel to me. Like there's and there's out of the twenty four, there's there's three that have any inscriptions on them. Okay. Um. Two with very little, and then one that's kind of covered in this scroll that we'll get into. But the vast majority of them are unmarked entirely. So mm -hmm. the conventional story for these is that, that that they are sarcophagus. Of course, every stone box is a sarcophagus. Mm -hmm. These were apparently sarcophagi for uh, for for bulls, Apis bulls, Serapis, Serapium. This is kind of how it gets its name in the modern time. Who knows what they called it back in the day? Uh, I unsurprisingly disagree with this hypothesis. <laughs> And and unsurprisingly, also there's very little evidence to support it. They've, I'm sure they've found bulls inside of all. They've them. never found a bull inside <laughs> oh, any of these. Okay, okay, shocking, uh, shocking. Yeah, well, so as far as we know, they were opened at some point in antiquity. We almost all of the boxes were opened. So when Auguste Mariette, who was a uh, I think French uh, explorer in the 1800s, who was kind of credited with the modern rediscovery of the Serapium, got in there. Uh, Every box except one was opened. So at some point, the, the lids were ajar, like they were pushed back or they were pushed forward or they were, they were tilted to the side. Uh, but he found one box that was sealed and he still had his lid on it. And he couldn't shift the lid. He tried. Mm -hmm. So he ended up using gunpowder and basically blew, the, blew it apart. There's, there's a, I probably have the box here. This is, this is the box that he blew apart. You can oh, actually very see. Nice. Uh, what he did, he, he, yeah, basically blew his way into this thing mm -hmm. uh, and found it completely empty. And where the, the Apis bull thing comes from is that there's next to, sort of in a different layer, a shallower layer in a similar bedrock area, like right next to the Serapium is what's known as the lesser galleries. These are much smaller tunnels, much more primitive. And inside those, and they're not connected to the, the Serapium as we know it, uh, but inside those tunnels, they found wooden boxes. And inside those wooden boxes, they found mummified Apis bulls. The okay. Egyptians certainly mummified Apis bulls. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a sacred animal to them. But there's a, it's a very tenuous connection to the Serapium um, uh, with the, the whole Apis bull thing. So, again, I think the likely thing here is this is probably a, a much more ancient site that was uh, discovered and reused and and used as a ceremonial site by the dynastic Egyptians, probably during the Middle and New Kingdoms. Um, and in fact, there's quite a bit of evidence to support that in in the way that in what's written on these boxes. And uh, it, it illustrates the Serapium is a great example of um, kind of illustrating. I think I have it in writing here. Is in uh, it, it kind of illustrates the 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 example of of what I would show as a, as a giant technological delta between the precision stonework that we see as reflected in these boxes. You saw in that precision slide that, you know, in some cases we have perfect 90 degree angles. Chris Dunn's shown that there's the lids were perfectly sort of perpendicular with the sides of the box, um, such that it formed a hermetic seal, so an airtight seal. Uh, there's, a, there's an aspect of this that um, is worth mentioning when it comes to this, to precision. Now, I often use precision as, as one of the indicators for some form of advanced technology. Uh, it, and it, it has to be a measured precision, something that, that we've measured and studied. You can't sort of, you can kind of eyeball something and say, well, it looks like it has aspects of precision, but we don't really know until we, until we investigate it and actually uh, measure it. These boxes have remarkably flat, not all of them, like they, they have extremely flat surfaces. They have a mirror finish. This is that polish is, is remarkable. A lot of them have 90, perfectly 90 degree angles. Now these are these are things that individually and on their own can be achieved. Like that, you can lap stones pretty flat. You can probably make ninety degree angles uh, inside. You can you can carve a corner. There's a, an aspect of 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 uh, overall precision though when you are looking at a, a at a single piece object in its entirety. It's the 
It's the perfection of form. It's the relationship between different faces and different parts of an object to another. And this this comes into play again when we talk about the vases. But, you know, there was a, a box um, that was studied along these lines. We'll come back to the writing on them in a minute. But mm-hmm. uh, there was a box that was studied along these lines in a, in a, in a different place. It's called Lahoon. And I hope I have a box. Yeah, I do have the Lahoon box here. Um, and it's and and this was actually in a different area. This is a uh, underneath a pyramid in Lahoon. It's a granite box with a with a in a granite room. And Petrie actually talks about this this aspect of precision on the box, which is and I'll, I'll quote him specifically from here. I think this is a great quote because he measured it and said, "Look, it's incre- it's incredibly flat surfaces." Uh, you know, you know, you've got like a seven thousandth of an inch error along the top, which is across one hundred and six inches, and he's sort of giving you the individual aspects of precision. But what he says here is, is I think, really important and is an often overlooked characteristic of these artifacts. And quoting Flinders Petrie uh, from eighteen ninety one, his book Illahoon, Cahoon, and Garob, quote: "Lastly, after straightness, flatness, and parallelism, there is the question of ratio between the dimensions or accuracy of proportion." This is far more difficult as it requires all the previous accuracies and in addition a truly divided scale and an irremediable truth of work since nothing can be corrected by removing more material, end quote. Now what Petrie's talking about here is the relationship between the various faces. So, you know, keeping things parallel to each other and straight and relative. So keeping the dimensions of the inside of the box, it's like in the Serapian boxes, to, to have one wall that's you know 10 feet away from this other wall at the other end perfectly parallel mm-hmm. is just an absolutely remarkable feat. And you can't fix it by removing more material. Once you make a mistake or you screw up, you're done. And so we, we see these aspects of precision, this relationship of one face to another in some of these boxes. We certainly see it in this one, and we see it in some other objects like vases. And it's a, as I said, it's a very much overlooked aspect of precision when when the naysayers and the skeptics of of this concept come out, and they say, "Look, I can make a flat piece of stone by lapping it, or I can take a block of granite and chisel a, like an inside corner on an outside piece." Like it's a different story when you're inside a box, I think, with flat surfaces. But you you have to you you have to evaluate the overall artifact and you have to meet the challenge presented by the by the the whole artifact including the most difficult aspects of it which include these types of things like these the relative uh precision of faces or the, the the challenges that are presented by a single piece artifact so you know chris dunn when he was studying these boxes uh and when he wrote his book about it um and i'll just throw up one of these boxes again you know he he went to like a he went to some granite producers and said, "Can we make one? Now we could, we could, could we do this? We could, sure, we could do this. We'd have to make some tools and they'd have to get custom equipment to make it." But these granite producers said, "Well, first of all, the block of granite is going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a huge piece of stone. But the way we'd make it is we'd make five slabs and bolt it together, right? That's that's the easiest way to do this, rather than trying to actually, you know, get one block of stone, carve it out, and make it perfect. So, you know, this is a tremendous challenge." Um, and not really achievable <laughs> with, with simple hand tools. So, you know, not only that, you've, so you've got these precision aspects of these boxes. You've got um, the fact that they're single piece boxes. The other huge, huge challenge presented by the Serapium, the real mystery, one of the real mysteries to me is the logistical challenge. So not only you've got to move the, the stone from the quarry, you know, now you've got to shift this thing down into an underground series of labyrinths and tunnels that, that in some cases with the biggest boxes, you've got like a foot of clearance between the, the width of the tunnels and the, the boxes themselves. It's absolutely insane. And the easiest way to do it would be to, well, you, you, you know, instead of it being underground, you, you, you excavate, you take the roof off and you lower these things down, then you build a roof on top of it. But that's not what we see here. This is tunneled into bedrock and above your head is literal bedrock. It's not constructed ceiling. So these things were moved in through this tunnel system and then lowered down into the center of these alcoves that are you know, probably six feet or more deep uh, into actually grooved uh, slots in the ground. Um, so there was... It's one of the clues, the many clues that after studying the Serapium for many years, I, I think the the attribute that the builders of these boxes was most they were most going for was was solidity, 
out of all of the aspects of stone, which doesn't make a lot of sense if you if you think this is well, it's a bull box, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to bury a bull in this, I don't need it to be precise. I, I can color within the lines, basically, more or less. You can just carve it out. You throw your bull and you put your lid on. Away you go. Who cares if there are hairline fractures or cracks in the box? Well, the people that made these things really cared about that. They they would go to tremendous effort to make sure that box was solid, like as if it had to resist or, or deal with some sort of pressure or force. Um, so the boxes are anchored into the floor. They literally have these inset grooves where they would slot them into the centers of these, these alcoves, which is also belies the theory that, oh, well, they filled the things up with sand and then dug the sand out and that's how they lowered them down. It's nonsense. They're actually slotted into the ground, into, into slots in the bedrock, so they fit right in. Then they would build floor tiles around them. But as you can see here, there's like they're not all straight, right? There's there's they're straight where they can be, but there's these weird divots and and scoops almost made out of the stone. This isn't an accident. This, so what they were doing here with these scoop marks on these boxes is they're removing cracks. And where do you see that? So you see the scoop marks on top here. Oh sure, yep. And even this big scoop mark on the side. Okay. So they would they would facet these boxes. Um, there's plenty of examples of uh, of of faceted boxes here. Um, this is a good one. Shows you the faceting. Kind of like a gemstone cut where they would do, if they could, they would, they would cut things and have these beautiful facets and straight planes, um, both on the sides and on the lid. And they're beautiful stone. I mean, it, it, and literally it's covered in dust these days, but these things reflect light, which is insane. Granite doesn't do that naturally. You have to, you know, kitchen counters and things. We, we polish those things really hard to get them that shiny. So the, the polishing is a whole other thing. But those scoop marks, in fact, you can see a couple. There's a little one on the lid here. There's a little bit cut out of the edge here. Uh, and that one we saw earlier, um, uh, you know, it, it has it has it has scoops in it. They were removing cracks, right? Mm, so okay. where there was a crack, it, it's like emptying the crack out. So imagine there's a, there's a crack in the stone. It's kind of like the same way we do it in aircraft maintenance and things like that, where you, you either you try to stop the crack from spreading, you either okay. drill a hole in it, or you, you know. So what they would do in the stone is they would scoop it out. They would they would literally empty the crack out so it couldn't continue. Mm. Now, who cares if this yeah. is literally a single-use box for a bull? Who cares if it's got a crack in it? Right. So, what's your thoughts? I mean, what you know, if this was, um, if this is significantly older than what we believe it to be today, what could they have been? You know, why would they have gone through that level of um, of, of work to create these things? What could they have been used for? Well, it's it's a it's, I mean, at, at that point, I I would say that I think they were functional. That's probably the best answer I can give you. It frustrates And, and it's just pure speculation, of course. No, well, no, no. I, I believe, I think there's evidence to suggest they were functional in terms okay. of the, the and there's, because there's a relationship between precision and function, there's a couple different lines of evidence for this. One is, so, you know, you don't develop the ability, uh, precision, it's a strange term. Everyone hears about it. Oh, I've got a precision shaver or razor or whatever, this, that, and the other thing. We use it a lot. But, there is a definitive relationship between precision and function. Precision costs money and resources to develop, right? Precision in the modern world started with the pursuit of trying to make cannons, naval cannons shoot straighter. Because normally you would cast a cannon, and then while it's hot, they'd fire a cannonball out of it and go, well, we hope that is going to fire straight from now on. So it turns out if you actually cast the thing and then you, then you carve out a barrel and you make that barrel nice and straight, you, you get better accuracy. Uh, so they started to think about, well, how can we get better at this? And we'd start to develop precision. Uh, they de we developed precision in, because we wanted to create chronometers and timepieces and watches. And then it's developed over time to there to the point where we have, you know, seven Newton meter processes to make, you know, custom integrated circuits and ASICs and stuff like that. Uh, and we do that because of the functional return. We, the billions of dollars that it costs to develop precision in the modern world in every aspect of our life be it from indu the industrial design on a toaster, you know, to to the to the microchips that run everything around us, that that those billions of dollars that it costs to develop those processes were done because of the functional return, right? It's it's like there's a you, you get a lower power footprint, it becomes more efficient, um, it works better. We get we get a return on it. So there's you don't do this unless you have a reason for it. So you, there's no need for this precision if this is a bull box. So that's one aspect I'd say. So they were they were chasing a function. And I think when you think about things like, well, they seem to also have been chasing solidity. Because that, that one box I showed you earlier, um, where Yusuf was standing next to it, this one here, 
Uh, it doesn't look as nice as the other ones, and that's because it, it isn't. It wasn't completely finished. Um, it developed a large crack. You can actually kind of see it. There's a huge crack in it. And I, I honestly think that they, they were in the process of finishing this box, and there's tons of evidence that they actually finished it. They worked on them down in these areas, which a whole other um, just presents a whole other set of problems. Mm -hmm. But this one was, a, well, this thing developed a crack, so we shelve it. It, it would work perfectly fine as a bull box, but they parked it in a back corner in, a, in an area that's off limits in the Serapium today. You have to get special permission to go in there. But they parked it because it had a crack. So that's another indication to me that they were, they were looking for these boxes to do something to withstand some force vibration. So who knows what? And then when you get into what that thing could be, there's, 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 any, there's any number of speculation. I mean, I, I have had the chance to read Chris Dunn's new book, the um, Tesla, the, um, the, Giza, the Giza Connection, a wonderful book. It's coming out early next year, I think. And he does some fantastic speculation on, on the Serapium about what that might be. But once okay. you say that, it, it just becomes speculation at that point. Sure. Right? You could speculate them as being any number of things, but it's, and I think that's where your imagination could take us. I actually think we should be open-minded to those ideas and maybe do some research to see, is there any evidence backing up those possibilities rather than just saying, well, no, they're all ceremonial. They're all done with, you know, pounding stones and grinding and that's it. Like that, I don't like that approach. You know, I, I, all I can say is that I don't know what they were for, but it's utterly fascinating. And the last thing that I'll mention about the Serapium is what I was, what I was going to get around to, which was to talk about the fact that this was a reused site by the Egyptians. So when you, when you look at the boxes that have writing on them, there's, there's two or three, as I said. One of them is, is this one. This is the most famous one because it has this writing on it, right? It's, this is me and Yusuf. And you can see how the box is inset into the floor. Like there's at least two feet of stone going down mm. below our feet here. Uh, giant thing. But it's, it's got this chicken scratch writing uh, all over it. And I love this image. This is a, it's cut out from one of my videos. In, in that, If you look on the, the right-hand side, on the corner, you can actually see how that box is. It, it's reflecting the light from the hallway. And you see the reflection of the hallway above it which shows you just how perfectly polished these things were. It's, it's remarkable. And you can see the quality of the stonework. Now, obviously, we know that you could make, the people who made the boxes had the capability to, to work stone to a remarkable degree. You could make, they could make straight lines. They could make flat surfaces. They could make granite shine. Why then is the writing on this box so terrible? <laughs> you can see this is clearly the result of some guy <laughs> that's gone at this thing with a with a hammer and chisel, right? Mm -hmm. To the point where it's even skipping. There's no straight lines. It's very much the result. You literally see the, the chisel marks from somebody attacking it with a chisel. Uh, you yeah. know, and not, you know, this is the result of a different level of technology, a much more primitive one. Yet, it this is kind of how Egyptology works. It's, it's the writing in many cases is kind of the bedrock of that institution. It's like they, because we've, develop the ability to read hieroglyphs and translate them. We depend on hieroglyphs. If there's hieroglyphs on an object or a site, then the story that it tells and the, the person that it says had it built, like that's the person's name that's there. That often is used to say, well, that person therefore either had this thing built or he had the whole site built. And that's also how what's been, what's been applied to the Serapium here. Which is kind of interesting when you see stuff like this, because on this same very box is an, what's an it's an empty cartouche, it's a, an empty Shen ring, right? This is a if people are familiar with hieroglyphs, you'll often see the Shen ring, the cartouche, and it's reserved for royalty, right? This is only used in the names of of the royalty, and this is an empty one. But if if there was the name of another of a ruler in here, whoever it might be, Ptolemy, someone like this, then we would say that Ptolemy had this built. Ptolemy probably had the whole site built, and then you can see how we construct this picture of history out of that. But it's an empty Shen ring. So this tells you something else I think that's going on here is that the priests, the people that ran this site, were likely selling dedications. Like it's like highest bidder gets to have their name written on this box that has all of the other, you know, afterlife paraphernalia on it. And we know this went on because all through the walls in the Serapium, there are you know, little indentations in the walls where little steles, so granite or limestone steles, these dedications were put in there. I mean, there's very few of those steles remaining, but the holes where they were are, are everywhere. Um, and it's just a, a lovely example of renovation. There's a bunch of other evidence for renovation on this site too. But yeah, it's very mysterious. It's, it's, it's a wonderful site. It's, it's often overlooked by a lot of the guidebooks and 
funnily enough, John Anthony West has said very little about it because he was, you know, a symbologist. He looked at the the dynastic Egyptian culture. There's very little writing and things to go on there. So it's like, ah, it's this big site with a few boxes in it and there's very little writing. So there's not a lot of interest to see. But I find the site utterly fascinating. Uh, I think it presents a, it's a huge smoking gun. I think in in the in for the evidence of of advanced technology. So you know, both in the stonework itself. The boxes, the logistics of moving them in there, and the technological delta that we see between the artifacts and the writing that's on them. And so is the writing that's on them, obviously you can tell that it's not, you know, you're not looking at straight lines, you're not looking at perfect angles, right. you know, none of that. Is the writing, uh, is the is it polished anywhere within the writing itself? No, that's a, it's another great indicator uh, of, of, of polish. It's another, I think, a great indicator of, um, of the fact that you don't ever see polished writing. And there's only you know, one or two examples of individual characters, which I actually think were incorporated into the writing. You just don't see polished writing. So wherever you even, and this becomes one of those, it's kind of like the, the stonework in South America, the different styles. Once you see this, you can't unsee it. Uh, you see it everywhere. So here's some other examples of that. There's, I, I love this statue. It's one of these. It's a Hyksos Sphinx that's in um, the Cairo Museum, and you can see how the, the stonework almost uses light to to show the rib line, the ribs of the of the structure made again out of very hard stone. But if you take a close look at the at the glyphs that are on it, they're crudely carved. They're carved deeply. You can see the hammer and chisel marks. The lines aren't straight, and it's not polished. Mm. Uh, you see this all over the place. There's there are. And we know they could polish fine details in stone, right? So this is a, one of the granodiorite statues from an old kingdom. You look at the the upper chest area; it's 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 just wonderful detail. Uh, you can even look at the fingernails, the cuticles, the thumb. I mean, even though there's dust in here, this is all polished stone. So the Egyptians had, or whoever built this statue, I should say, <coughs> had the ability to polish stone. They had to, it didn't have to be a flat surface. They could polish the stone. That the scoop marks in the Serapian boxes. Extremely difficult thing to polish. They're all perfectly polished. I mean, they're not, they're very irregular, but you know, you just don't see it. And here's, you know, for example, here's the writing on the side of one of these statues from the old kingdom. It's a bit better quality writing, but you can still see even the lines on that cartouche, they're not straight. Look at the inside of the bird, it's not polished, and you can see the hammer and chisel marks. And if you tour around through the Egyptian museum, you start to see it everywhere, right? This is one of the one of the well-done lids. I say these are great hieroglyphs that are on it. But you can clearly say, I like this shot because it, it shows you the polish of the stone versus the glyphs itself. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think there's a, a huge technological delta between the writing and the objects. And I think a lot, in fact, in fact, nowhere have I seen writing, even the very best writing. And this is the stuff that's on the obelisks and things. It's, it's all achievable with hand tools. Like the, the writing, and you look closely in the corners of those and you can see the, the the probably flint or barrel chisels you see the tool marks i mean it, it undoubtedly became a high art form i mean it's not all poor quality writing we know there's great writing um but it's all achievable with hand tools it doesn't show the same signatures of tool marks and machining um uh the polishing the the, the objects that the aspects that i think represent you know advanced forms of technology you don't see that in the writing so mm. it there's a huge technological delta there and it you know, the one last thing I'd say about the writing that I've heard people talk about is like, well, well, it's a different person doing the writing. Yeah, maybe. But that's not to say that they, sh they don't have the same tools or that it might have even been the same person. It's like that, tr that skill, if you're a good, if you can draw or you're good at calligraphy, you try doing that in stone, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's obviously not the same skill set. <laughs> we have evidence for how this would work. There's literally artifacts with paint on them. So you'd have the scribe or the artist actually paint. They, they would draw on the stone. And here's what you got to go carve. And then you get the stone carver, presumably the same guy or from the same class with the same tools that carve the object itself. And he's got to go carve these details. How come there's a gap there? Like it's the same tools. Like you, we see the fine details, made, perfectly made, perfectly polished, incredible precision on the statue or on the artifact, but we don't see that reflected in the writing. I just think... Mm -hmm. Is entirely a possible explanation for this is that they inherited these artifacts and then through time, the hubris and arrogance of kings, they added writing to it later. And mm -hmm. this is backed up by evidence in a lot of cases. There's some artifacts with three or four, even five different rulers' names on them where 
we literally another name for Ramses the Great that Petrie would call him was the Great Usurper, because he was notorious for carving his name over the top of 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 other pharaohs even like in fact there's 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 evidence for this as well like this is a great example of that this is at a site called Tanis this big cartouche here is Ramses the second he's the known as one of the the most powerful rulers in all of Egypt but if you look closely at the end on the right you can see what he was doing he was carving his name and his glyphs very deeply over the top of pre-existing glyphs and that 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 would have been standing upright at one point in time oh this is actually you uh, you can unpack this statue this this picture quite a few ways. I, I actually love this because it's it's the example of multiple levels of reuse, right? So yeah. this is a fragment from an obelisk. So if you've seen obelisk when they're standing up, the writing is also vertical. Yeah, sure. So, but this, this one is written on sideways. It's high, sideways yeah. and written on twice sideways. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it's it's a it was once an obelisk that was vertical. It broke, fell over, was reused in a wall. Somebody then decided, well, I'm going to put my name and I'm going to do my stuff to it here. And then Ramses came along later, and then uh-huh. he reused it again. So you've, you've got like three different reuses of this one piece of stone uh-huh. uh, in a wall here. And it's, I mean, it's just, it's, it illustrates the problem that you have is, is the, these sites have been through thousands of years of construction, destruction, quarrying, yep. reuse, relabeling. And, you know, you're trying to put together a puzzle that it's like all the little bits are torn up and reshaped and some of them are wet and some of them are gone. I mean, it's just... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it. I love this piece of stone, but yeah, this is probably a piece from an obelisk. I think it was. Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. some other feature up here on like the, the top left. I don't know what that is. So, yeah, yeah. It, who knows? But I I do think that that you can't depend on the writing to 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 date and age stuff. And right. as you said before, can't really age stone. Right. Yeah. Very logical. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Makes you scratch your head and wonder. It certainly doesn't seem like it was the same people that were doing the writing that made those boxes that we just took a look at. I mean, it's two no. completely different. T- and I'm sure the makers of the boxes would be <laughs> probably pretty upset with people banging on their their uh, their pissed. artwork like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what about the uh, vases? Let's shift gears to the vases. The vases. So, so some of the same um, aspects of uh, of precision that we talked about absolutely fit with the vases. But so. It's probably worth grounding people a little bit in what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so they exist within Egypt. It's it's one of the most interesting categories of artifacts for me. I've been fascinating, fascinated with them for a long time. But, you know, there exists this category of artifacts uh, in, in ancient Egypt. It's these, these hard stone vases. So you have these hard stone objects. They're very large. They get boxes and you know, 100 or even 1,000 ton statues. But they also exist in, in the very small. And, in fact, some of these go down to about the size of your thumb. And some of them, you know, might be yay high off the floor, like that. So they scale up and down. But there's tens of thousands of them. And and the interesting thing about the vases is is that they they're made from again these very hard types of stone. Some of them quite exotic, like like this one bottom right here is, you know, corundum. It's, this is made with very high degree of corundum. There's the famous schist discus here. You have corundums are nine. Corundums are nine on the most scale. So, so yeah. either so what could carve that? Either diamond, diamond. or could corundum? Corundum, other yeah, beryl and other types of nines would okay. probably shape it. Okay. Um, extremely difficult material. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And and it's and the other thing with mean, all of these stone types that I've talked about, uh, the granites, the conglomerates, the you know, the, there's they're not a it's a difficult material to work not only because it's hard, but because it is in fact made up of different minerals that vary in hardness themselves. So, if you're looking for a precise surface or a precise finish, you know it that's becomes even more difficult to achieve when you're talking about a like a, a heterogeneous substrate. Like it's not the thing about steel or iron or aluminium, uh, aluminum. Sorry, <laughs> in the, I'm, I'm an American now. Yeah. Uh, aluminum. You know, it's it's a consistent homogeneous su- substance. Like it's the same hardness all the way through. Versus, you know, granites. You've got mica and hornblende and silica and quartz. You know, and they vary in, in hardness. So, so like the tooltip pressure that you're using, you know, it, it cuts differently through one material almost on the microscopic level than it might just rip a chunk out of quartz or something. So this gets illustrated in these vases. Like it's an extremely difficult medium to work. So you've got all these exotic types of of stone, and there's dozens of different types of stone involved in this, you know, nice and schist, and I mean any endless numbers of uh, of these types of stone. But they were able to work them down to just incredible degrees of precision. So this is one of a great example I like to use. Uh, you know, Flinders Petrie found an example that was down like one fortieth of an inch thick. 
they got the stone down on 40th of an inch thick. This is not that example, but this shows you just how thin this material is. It's a very hard stone phase. You see the large crystal inclusions in the stone. Uh, this would have been extremely brittle, but yet the break in it and the close-up of it on the right here, you can see just how thin this material has mm. worked down to. This is a, a, a astonishing result. Um, you know, some of them show other just perfect symmetry and balance. This is one of my favorite examples in the Egyptian museum. Um, sits on its tip almost like the tip of an egg. It's just perfectly made and perfectly balanced. And we, you know, we see these examples from time and time again. So they show all these elements of precision balance and uh, you know all of this type of thing they they come from the earliest times in ancient egypt in fact they go back to well and truly before um dynastic egypt even starts lots of these were found in pre-dynastic burials the nadak culture uh some of them were found going back as far as fourteen thousand years ago there's there's one that uh from a, a site called toshka uh, which is a primitive burial that's now underwater since they created the the high dam in egypt but it was excavated in the 60s. They found primitive pottery and these hard stone precision vases. So we know they existed. Uh, the vast majority of them were found beneath what's called the Step Pyramid of Djoser. So this is an example uh, of, of like the original excavation from um, Jean-Philippe Loyer, who excavated this, uh, I think, in the early 1900s uh, at, at Saqqara. So beneath the Step Pyramid, which is supposedly the Proto-Pyramid, it's attributed to Djoser and Imhotep. More than 40, between 40 and 50,000 of these things were found down there in these galleries. I've been in down in there. As you can see fragments of them. I actually have a picture of one that I took uh, here on the right. So they exist in this early time. They exist up until the start, the early part of the old kingdom. And then they mostly disappear. That's the real strange thing about these things. They don't really appear in the record in dynastic Egypt after that time. But what does appear? Uh, what you do get at that point is is essentially these things, um, alabaster vases, right? So then you mentioned alabaster is about a it's a, a three, three or three. it's yeah. like I think it might be softer than marble. So alabaster or white calcite is another type of stone. So it's uh, close to a fingernail, I guess. Well, it's, yeah, it's a little it's well, you, it's it's hard. It can be harder, harder, okay. a little harder than that. But it's okay. put it this way, much much easier to work. Than uh, than granite, you can, and it's a much more consistent sub substance. You can grind it away much more easily. You can carve it and shape it. And this is kind of what happens after this period. You see these alabaster vessels, and I mean these are beautiful, right? They're they're wonderful. They're they're uh, artwork. This these persist right through to the end of the Egyptian civilization. But they're clearly not. They don't display the same aspects of precision that the hardstone bases do. They're not perfectly symmetrical. They're a little wonky in places. Um, you know, they, they're, they're not the same thing. They're definitely handmade. And that, in fact, and, and we know how they were made. In fact, there's a scene on a wall at Saqqara that shows them making it. And, and I, can, I can show you that as well. There's a, where is it? This thing here. So this is the scene on the wall. Now, what happens with Egyptology is they say, well, this is how they made all the vases. But look at this thing in the middle. Like They're clearly making alabaster vases it's basically this idea of well we had a stick with a bent stick with you know weights on the side of it that had a flint tip and we're rotating <laughs> it and that's how we're drilling it out and you know here's us grinding and rubbing on on vases with our hands it's all the big ones it's not the tiny ones well they do have these little ones here it looks like but they would make little vases as well um mm -hmm. and in fact this technique is still used to this day in the luxor region to craft alabaster vases you got out they've got the machine made ones too but you can go and and buy handmade alabaster vessels that they make using pretty much these same techniques. They get these metal things <laughs> grind away at the stone mm -hmm. and they make them. And, and so we have, this is this tale of two industries. We've got, we've got an industry of artifacts that match the tools and techniques that we know the dynastic Egyptians used. Then we have this other vases that really don't. And, and, and I like the vases. I consider them really a smoking gun in this story because they disappear. There's a few exceptions. Uh, there are some hardstone vases that appear later, but we we attribute them to later periods because they've got some really poorly made writing on them, right? Mm -hmm. Because some dude had his name scratched into it later, and we go, oh, he he must have had that made. Imagine you're mm -hmm. a collector with, of one of these, like a, some rich German guy that has a has a vase, and if he wants to be buried with it, 
and he goes into his mausoleum and he takes his treasures with him. And one of them is this Hearthstone vase. And and a thousand years later, after our civilizations ends, we dig him up. It's like, oh, this guy must have had this made. I mean, it's already uh, at least five thousand years old. Who? It's, it's a really crazy assumption to make that that just because either someone's name is on it or it was found in this burial, that that's when it was made. I I think what was going on with what happened was Joza with his forty to fifty thousand of them. In fact, this is even admitted by the mainstream. They say that oh, because there's names of older pharaohs and some of them, they know he was out collecting them. Like he was been a powerful king. First, mm -hmm. I mean, a powerful king. He First was, dynasty? Third. Third dynasty. Third okay. dynasty. Mm -hmm. Well, and we, we have some of these, like the schist disc is found in a first dynasty structure. We have plenty of them that are pre-dynastic. Um, you know, he was out, he collected them. He got as many as he could. He got probably most of them. For, he raided other tombs and he had them all buried with him. And they stayed buried with him until they were either robbed or smashed. And then we found what was left. And when, and when did we find them? In Jean Philippe Loyer was excavated, I think, in the very, in the late, probably the very early 1900s, a French uh, archaeologist. There's actually a lot of really good images um, from some of his books, the, the Pyramids to Gallery. It's in French, but the, the, the plates are great. Uh, and you can, this was, this was an image here from, you know, you can see that the hard That's stone the vases. original excavation there. Yeah, so this is in one of the galleries, and a lot of it's smashed up. And if you go down there today, you use special permission. I mean, it's amazing. Beneath the step pyramid is like five, six miles of tunnels and different levels, but there's piles and piles of fragments of these vases still down there. So 40,000 of them approximately buried, more, but more than 40,000 mm -hmm. buried underground from, be, from the time of the Third Dynasty mm -hmm. until the early 1900s. Yeah, I think they were definitely robbed. I think they were, these probably weren't considered super valuable. People were tomb robbers okay. and looking for gold. Okay. And they may well have smashed a lot of them just because they thought there was something in them and that's the quickest way to get into them. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. of them were stopped up with mud lids. It's too, harder like, to smash the stone ones. Well, you well, the thin ones, mate. The thin yeah, ones, right. a lot of the thin stuff, the brittle stuff would have smashed, but the, the sure. big heavy ones would have been tough to tough mm -hmm. to break. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and some of that a lot of them were stopped up with mud lids, which is kind of an interesting thing on its own. Like these are these, they're just these are mud lids that are displayed, you know, in the museum quite proudly next to these vases. Because some of them were probably used as canopic vessels. So they had the ability to make these perfectly uh <laughs> these perfect stone uh jars and these were the lids these that, are the they, lids. that yeah, they put on. Lids. Uh, yeah. I, I, that I, makes I, sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Particularly when you consider later on with the alabaster vessels, they made lids. Uh -huh. They had no problem making lids. They were like, hey, this is a canopic jar. I want my little pharaoh head lid to go on it too. Uh -huh. And you find then there's some beautiful examples of those. But it's again, it's this huge contradiction. And you know, so this is where it gets interesting with these these vases, is because you know, and this has been very exciting for me uh, personally because I've been banging on about these phases for years. But just recently, and anyone that's watched my channel or seen me on JRE, we're talking about it. But just in the last few months, really, or this year, I guess, uh, we've had the chance to actually analyze these vases in some more detail. There was a pre dynastic stone vase, granite, hard granite stone vase, a rose granite one. Uh, this one here, actually, um, from a private collector. And we, uh, there's a couple of aerospace engineers, um, uh, Alex Dunn and Nick Sierra, who are, who are just, you know, metrolog professional metrologists and aerospace engineers. And they scanned this thing with structured light scanning, which gives us the ability to basically map it out down to the thousandth of an inch or, and then some. Uh, since then, they've been CT scanned and there are even more accurate scans of it now. But, uh, that enables us to then really analyze the aspects of precision that we find on the vase. And, and what they found was just astonishing. Um, so you remember before we were talking about the relative, the relative, the relative geometric shape, like of an object. Um, so you can measure the vase for like how flat's the top of the lid, you know, like how flat's the bottom, how, you know, how perfect is the, how circular is it? We can do those things and we do, but when, what it becomes when it becomes really interesting once you start to look at the relative uh, relative surfaces, like how perfect is the bottom of the vase relative to the top of the vase, or you know how 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 do these shapes match each other on it? So what you have to do that the blaze itself is is like oblate. It's it's you know it doesn't conform to any specific geometric shape, and so you need a specific geometric shape. I'm talking about things like spheres, cones. Uh, cylinders, torrids, things like that, where where you can then perform geometry on them. You can determine 
what's the center line you know what's the what what angles the center line at where's the center point if it's a if it's a sphere you know like stuff like that like how perpendicular or parallel is this shape to something else you can do those operations so what they did was that they scanned the vase you can see it here this is like a model of it that that is the res result of this structured light scanning process and you map geometric shapes to the vase right so we so you start basically with the, the top of the lid and you can kind of see how this works. And, and all we're measuring here is like, okay, how flat is the top of the lid? And the way you do this is you match, you match a geometric shape to a part of the vase. So in this case, it's a flat plane and we're matching it to the, the doing like a best fit to the top of the vase. And it, you know, you could do this with four points of, you can say, well, it matches it in these four points and we can measure the shape there. The more points you use, the more accurately the shape reflects the surface of the of the object so in this case you know they've used nearly four thousand points to match a, a a flat plane to the top of the vase and one measurement we can make is look at okay how flat is it to a perfectly flat geometrical surface and you can see it's within three thousandths of an inch of being flat so and again this is these are numbers that people may not understand what they mean but three thousandths of an inch is you know about the width of a human hair Right, it's it's mm -hmm. it's an it's an infinitesimal kind of measurement. It's um, you know a sheet of printer paper is is thicker than that, uh, that type of thing. So you're down in the thousands, and these are things that are barely perceivable, or not perceivable by eye, you know, arguably not perceivable by touch, but it's flat. So this, but the other the other aspect when you start to talk about relativity, what this does is it gives us a top surface, like it gives us a like an x axis. So now we've got a flat surface we can measure against. The other parts of the vase and you can start to speed this up and see where's this go okay so now we're measuring the vase mouth or like kind of the neck of the vase if you like and we're using you know ten and a half thousand points of measurements to fit a cylinder inside this this neck of the vase right so we're more than ten thousand points of reference so it's very accurate representation of um the neck of the vase and we can look at things like cylindricity so how cylindrical is that cylinder that we've stuffed in there like how well does it match it well it's within 13 thousandths of an inch which is pretty good because this thing's actually old it's damaged it's pre-dynastic uh it's it's one of those it matches i don't know half a dozen examples that i've seen of, of pre-dynastic vases in um in museums and now that we've measured that we can also do something else because we've got the top surface and we've got a cylinder we can we can measure the center line of that cylinder and say well how perpendicular is that cylinder that center line to the top of the vase and it's within one thousandth of an inch right wow. so it's that's kind of crazy and mm. it it sort of gets more and more crazy as we step out from there so that's precision i yeah. mean you know and now you're talking about so this is one of the first objects if not the first object to be subjected to that level of precision analysis that's pretty exciting as far as i know this yeah. is the first yeah. time this has been done and i i, I consider this a genuine uh step forward in 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 the research and the in in the understanding of the degree of precision that this represents so i can go through endless other examples you know the bottom of the vase and the this you know the cone or the sphere that matches the bottom and how perfect it is with the top it's 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 the results are utterly remarkable and i have people are interested we ha i have long videos that get into the details of this and i'm in the process of writing an article about it um but but what it means is the interesting thing, right? So engineers and machinists, the people that do, you know, precision manufacturing, they see this and they get it. They go, holy crap. Like this, this is A, forget about doing this by hand. Not in a million years. I don't care what hand tool you're using. Could you do this? You would need a, probably a, some of our very best precision lathes, if not 3D mills even. To make this, because there are there are parts of this vase that that are, are very challenging. The lug handles, right? It's it's difficult to lathe the lug handle when you if you're lathing the vase body. How do you explain the lug handles, which also display similar elements of precision? How, by do, the way. how do you explain the lug handles? You know, the, uh, so 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 so, yeah. so in a, in a lathe, you you spin the you spin the vase around, yeah. and and you're essentially carving it from the outside. But the lug right. handles were not attached to the vase at a later point in time. The lug no, handles. They're part of it. They're a part of the vase, and so what you have to somehow figure out a way to do is to carve the area that's between the lug handles. and And what's the explanation for how that's done? Well, 
So this this is presents some other problems, and this is Be because you don't lose precision, oh. right? But but in right. the space between the lug handles. Yeah, I got so I got a picture of it here actually. Um, let's just look at the lug handles here briefly. Right. So so yeah, if you're spinning this on its lengthways axis, what you'd probably do if you're on a lathe is you'd leave a bull nose the whole way around, mm -hmm. and then you'd come back later, and you'd carve away the area between the lug handles, leaving you the lug handles sort of as we see them. Uh, so we did look at that. We looked at the area between the lug handles, and there's a there's a there's an issue with this is because there's as you said no lack of precision. When when we looked at the surface of the vase body between the lug handles, it showed the same degree of astonishing precision that we see on the rest of the vase, and that's really challenging because even in our very best machines today, when you do a tool change, like this is a tool and process change, right? So you you go from a lathe to some other technique, what whatever it is, like machining something that's that's removing that area it introduces errors you're changing the process you're changing the tool tip probably uh it introduces errors and this is accounted for even in our very best machining and manufacturing processes today like it's a there's a degree of error that comes in from that fact that we're changing tools and process we don't see that on this so you you have you come to a conclusion there's one of two options with this so it's either either the way that they could handle tool and process changes was better than what we could do, or that's not what happened and it was made in a single pass, which means you need five axes of freedom, essentially a CNC mill. You need something that can carve like the best, and we have these five axes CNC mills that can carve complex shapes out of hard material like steel or stone. I'd, I'd love to see someone try and make this out of granite and match the precision. I'm not sure, you know, it's a real challenge. Put it, I'll put that out there. Um, but so those are the two options. It's either they were better at doing tools, tool process changes than we were, or it was made in a single pass in a complex machine. And not just any machine, even, I mean, even if you grant them the use of the lathe, again, remember, no wheel in the old kingdom, certainly not pre-dynastic. And the lathe is a very sophisticated use of the wheel. This isn't a simple lathe either. Like these are precision lathes. We're talking about a, a, an incredibly hard substance in the, in the granite. We're talking about degrees of error within, you know, single digit thousands of an inch. So you're talking about extremely precise bearings, rods, turn screws, like the elements of you have to, the amount of force just to clamp this piece of stone into work, it has to be significant. Like this is a high end, this would require a high end lathe to do. And that's what the challenge is. And it's, you know, people are having a pink fit trying to figure out how this was done or, or explain it away. I mean, the people are saying all sorts of things. They're calling the vase fake and saying it's a modern forgery. Um, that's all nonsense. I'd love to see somebody try and make it and, and justify even making it for the price that sort of these things are worth. I think all that's just nonsense um, because at this point we, we have access to other vases and we, we are continuing to scan other artifacts. I am hoping to get into museums to see this because I certainly see the visual elements of precision that this thing reflects in other vases. And I think we'll, we'll find similar results in vases from museums. We're definitely scanning other vases. And we're seeing similar results in those. But on this particular vase, what's, the whole process was really cool. Um, these guys, uh, Alex and Nick, came to me just, I mean, it couldn't have, time it couldn't have worked out better. It was literally a couple of months before I went on Rogan. So I'm mm -hmm. like, and I, suddenly you've got this information, which is, you know, fantastic news and, and just revelatory information. And I've, some now got access to like a big platform to talk about it. We did that and then we open sourced the data. And this was the nicest thing about it, right? We, we put the data out there for anyone to, to look at. You can download, you can go to my website and download the STL, stick it in a blender or whatever and, and play with it. And so we got some interesting results when we did that. There's a, a Danish cryptographer took a look at it and he started to reverse engineer the mathematics that were behind it. And what he found about this vase, I think is even more astonishing because you know, not only did he find geometric patterns that were encoded in it, it seems like he almost reverse engineered the mathematics that were behind it. And it turns out that this thing was based on a pretty sophisticated series of algorithms. And it may well have been, in fact, mathematically designed. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a little complex to, to, to go through, but I can, um, I don't know if I have the slides here for it specifically, I don't. But essentially what he did, he was looking for geometric patterns. He found, okay, so we, we can match objects like the, the flower of life is one, which is a circular pattern. And, but what he found was that, that the curvatures on this vase, so the tiniest of curvatures and the lips 
like underneath the handles, like the lug handles, the curves at the bottom of the vase, you know, they're all sections of circles, right? So the circle's the main primary that's used to make this. You know, it's, it's a small part of a circle and the radius of these circles can range from like 42 millimeters down to like one millimeter. Wow. So, you know, try and draw a one millimeter diameter or radius circle uh, with, your, with any instrument, it, you're going to have trouble. But he, what he found was that all of those curvatures, the diameters of all of those circles and only those diameters matched a specific algorithm. And if there were other diameters or other, other you know, uh, sort of other radiuses of, of circles, it, it would have thrown this off. But there was at least 12 or 13 that, that fit this very specific uh, algorithm that he called the radial traversal pattern. And it shows you that that it's it's this deep degree of of mathematical interrelationship that cannot have just been an accident. Like, you know, there are there aren't curves on this thing that throw off this pattern, right? So it's there was a specific design used to create the curvatures on this on this vase that, that come from a very specific algorithm that that really indicate that this thing was probably mathematically designed. And and not only that, I mean how you go from design to output is, is, a, is a real open question too. So there's, there's all these implications that come from this scan that, that, are, that take us to realms that are just so far beyond this idea of this being done by, by eye, by some guy with, you know, rubbing on it with rocks and with hand tools. It, it gets a little crazy, but it's, it's, that's where the evidence is leading. Um, so I, I genuinely am excited about the, the, vase, the vase work and I, I, I can't wait to... There's more analysis happening. Uh, there's more vases um, being looked at. I, we're, we're, we're in the midst of trying to put together proposals for museums. Mm -hmm. We've had some interest and, and at least had some dialogue with, with some museums. Generally, you know, Egyptologists aren't interested in, you know, crazy YouTubers and engineers. But I, 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 th I would love to think that we could actually convince them to let us scan some of these artifacts, the ones that, that have, you know, uh, I guess you documented providence from from specific sites, I and mean, that's why they're in museums. You know, mm -hmm. there are lots of these things in private collections uh, around the world. That's the nature of the antiquities market. Um, but there's also lots of stuff in museums, and, and and we'd love to be able to get in there. It's non-destructive. It won't hurt. It's if anything, we're 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 providing a digital preservation of the artifact. You have an extremely accurate digital representation of this artifact that's going to persist as long as there's you know medium to store the data on. Uh, whatever happens to the to the artifact. So, yeah, I'm really hopeful on this. There's, and I, I think it's it's really stuck in the craw of uh, a lot of the critics of this movement. They're, they're not particularly happy about this, um, the evidence that's coming out in relationship to these vases. But I'm, I couldn't be more excited about it. I think it's wonderful. It's it, it is. It's very exciting. It's overwhelming evidence. You know, for for something greater than flint chisels and pounding stones, for, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah, when I saw you on Joe Rogan, um, you know, back in, I guess it was January and you yep. were, you were talking about these vases, um, just full disclosure for the audience. I went out and got a couple of them, you know, <laughs> and, um, I, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things where, you know, if you, if you look at them and you go online and you try to, you try to find them, they're, they're varying degrees of sophistication for sure. You know, there's some that are extremely, that look like they're extremely precise and some that, you know, look like they're, they're not quite as precise, you know, with the, for sure. um, so they, they come in different shapes and sizes, but, um, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know if, if there is, um, yeah, I'll, I'll have to, I know you, you haven't seen, uh, mine yet. I, I sent you a, a picture, but, yeah. um, but, um, yeah, you'll have to see if that could be something that you might want to scan at some point in the future too. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll work on, we'll see if we want to, if we want to do that. It'd be epic. Yeah. I'd love yeah. to see them. And, and you make a good point. And, and I want to be clear about this too, is that is that yeah? They're not all like this. Like the yeah. Egyptian, there's there's clearly the Egyptians didn't just make alabaster ones either. They, they, they were able to, you know, as again, flint will work granite. There's definitely vases that were made by hand, but there's absolutely a category of these things that 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 can't really have been achieved that way. At least nobody's proven that they can. Not even close. So it's the tale of two industries. It again. is the tale of two industries. Yeah, yeah. and you see, and we again we see we've looked at it kind of. We didn't really look at the examples of other boxes before, but but that those certainly exist. We see it in columns. We see it in vases. We see it in statues. We see it in boxes. We see it in slabs. You even see it in pyramids, which we mentioned earlier. So, yeah, I I think I, I the vases to me though for the for the ancient technology side of things is I just think they're the smoking gun. Just because these hard stone precision examples don't really exist 
afterwards and and certainly not to the degree that that these ones do um they got very good at it and other cultures got got were able to shape hard stone and and certainly once we got mechanized we could we could do it um but yeah the the fact that these are so old and and mm. so mysterious and in such in such volume that we find uh from very early on i yeah i i i i think these are they're very difficult to explain within the context of the the orthodox story of history and that's yeah. Yeah, they're fascinating to me, and I, I hope, I, I genuinely hope that uh, we. And I'm not, I don't want to bash any museum creator. Like I'm, I'm genuinely would like to see. Uh, I think this is this is an opportunity to learn more about their manufacture, wherever the evidence leads. Right? right, it's not. I'm not, you know, I can speculate. It's, you know, I'm a crazy YouTuber. I don't, I don't, I don't have a. I'm not writing textbooks or anything. Sure, but I genuinely think that that we sh that I, I and I'd like to think that we have museums and people that have access to these things that would be open minded enough to at least see where the evidence leads. Right, and right. leave the spec. You can you don't have to speculate, but we can measure them. Like we can define some of these aspects and say, well, this is what we found, and hey, here's a beautiful sort of digital model that you could maybe put out to the world. It's yeah, I don't. You know, it's, it's just all good. I I, I yeah. love the idea, and particularly just the open the open source nature of this investigation was very inspiring for me. The fact that so many people became interested in it. I had thousands of comments, and so many people that were looking at the model, and, and people have sent me printed vases. There's, you know, mm -hmm. I, like it's amazing what's happened as a result of of putting this data out there. Yeah. Um. And I I only hope that we can continue. So. Fascinating. Yeah, it's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's just so interesting to compare, you know, the results and to have that level of technology and looking at these artifacts and to, right. to see the precision on them and compare that with the toolbox, with the, with the ancient toolbox of the ancient Egyptians, you know, and it's, yeah, um, yeah it's absolutely amazing. This could be, this could be a um, major step forward for you in your ability to kind of push your theory forward about you know, ancient civilization and, and have that become more of a, you know, a, 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 a question that at least to talk yeah. about, you know, a viable sort of a theory. And, yeah. and so it's got to be a critical part of your work. And, I, and you know, it, it, it would come down to, I guess, you know, additional scans for sure. You would want to scan additional artifacts and, 100%. and then the provenance, you know, you want to make sure that oh, yeah. you're, and that's why you're talking about museums so that, you know, you, 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 you're approaching, um, the artifacts that either have great provenance or that, you know, that have been, that have unquestionable provenance right. that have been in, in museums. And yeah, so it's, yeah. it's a really fun and exciting project. And yeah, when I started, when I heard you talking about it on Rogan you know, back in <laughs> January, I was like, oh my God, wow, that's, wow. that's gotta be the coolest thing that's happening right now. Well, getting <laughs> so, involved. It's yeah, great. Yeah, for sure. For Excellent. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the most, the most criticism I've heard levied at this is I typically, typically call it like these weak cries of providence it's i i just i generally i look there's there's certainly other vases that are being looked at that have much more uh documented providence than the, the first the initial vase that we looked at uh i don't actually think it's an issue at all for this vase because i just i don't think you i i want to see somebody make one I'll try and make if you think it's a fake then let's see it made right and good luck getting the money spent to how many tools you're going to burn through trying to get to this level of precision mm -hmm. like don't make it something that's close make match it like that's you know, figure out and work it out, and design it mathematically. All the aspects of incredible aspects that we've that have come out of the study of this vase. You know, it it also matches. I can show you a half dozen examples of pre dynastic vases that it matches. And yeah, it's just to me, it's 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 a very weak argument. It's the only one that can be thrown up about this. And if you don't like it, then let's get access to some of the ones that right. I uh, you know have documented providence that you know Petrie found this one here and. That's why the reason it's behind glass in the museum. I'm more than willing to, to, to go through that exercise. In fact, I would very much like to. Mm -hmm. um, and as and we are proceeding as best we can. We are using, like I said, some of the, the additional uh, artifacts that we're looking at certainly have better providence. And I would hope that we'll get to the ones that have established problems. But as you said, I also think this scanning technique, it's like, I've, I've always say we should be applying ourselves as best we can with all of our technology to solving some of these questions. So I'd love to see this done on, you know, larger objects, boxes, statues, headjets, right. faces, crowns. I think we could learn so much uh, from the ability to really accurately digitize this stuff. Um, for example, this whole, we talked about the drill cores and drill holes earlier. Like that's a great subject and something that we could, 
we could further analyze with the use of high-end digital scans. I've, I've, we, I've been lucky enough that we've been able to get some photogrammatical uh, scans that, while not probably to the same degree of accuracy that you'll get with, you know, like CT or structured light scanning, give us enough accuracy, I think, where we can start to learn more about some of the drill holes in Egypt. I've, we've had that done uh, recently. So. so I think there's endless applications for this. And do you have an image of the Ramses head that Christopher Dunn worked I do. on? I do. That's a fascinating image that it is. He, he overlaid. Yeah. So I mean, this is. I mean, this is this is an example uh, of uh, another. Uh, we've I've often talked about these heads. We talked about symmetry, uh, and symmetry being one of the aspects of precision. We see remarkable symmetry, particularly in these statues. So, you know, this is one of the one of the images. This comes from Chris Dunn's book, uh, essentially showing you that the, you have the same curvatures being used in different places, which is an indication of how it was. Um, how it was manufactured, but but the one the, the probably the best example yes uh, that that I can share is this again an image from Chris Dunn's book. Unfortunately, this head is now back up on top of the statue, like thirty feet up in the air. So, okay. uh, uh, what this is, it's a reverse transparency overlay. So, so they probably saw this this work. <laughs> I think and, it may have had something to do with it. Yeah, Although, yeah, to be yeah. fair, they've been restoring a lot of these statues. They, okay. I'm 50 50 on it, to be honest. They, they con they're basically concrete sculpting a lot of the body and then they're putting back to the pieces that they have because they don't have all the pieces. Okay. There's no mistaking the ancient bits for the, for the modern bits, but I mean, well, the modern bits for the ancient bits, rather, the perfection of the ancients. But I mean, it's nice that they're putting it back together, but in a lot of cases, they're, they're making them inaccessible for, for like detailed study. Uh, this thing used to be sitting on the ground here, as you can see. So you see two Chris Dunn's on the left and the right, right? There isn't two Chris Dunn's, there's only one. Uh, so what you do is you take a photo directly on centerline, uh, you copy the photo, and then you flip it on that vertical axis, right? So you've basically, you're, you're mirror imaging it to the other side. You make both photos 50% transparent and you overlay them. So what you would get is you would see where the, where the features don't match from left to right. You would see blurriness, you see overlaps, and we just don't see it. Like that's what's remarkable about this is it's perfectly symmetrical I mean, at least within the boundaries of this test, um, yeah. which is an, a, just an astonishing feature to see in, 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 a, in a granite artifact this large. You don't see that on humans in, we, in general. Humans that's are, right. are, not, are not perfectly when symmetrical. None of us, in fact. You know, our left nostril is different to the right, right one and right. eyeballs. And yeah, it's not a human feature. And it's, you know, this isn't something you see reflected in classical artwork either. I mean, I've seen David by Michelangelo, sure. damn thing nearly brought me to tears it's a beautiful sculpture but it it's not symmetrical and it, it's magical artwork but this to me is like not only is david not symmetrical and yet it's absolutely beautiful but it's also made out of mar marble, marble you know, <laughs> yeah. which is a three on the Mo most scale yeah much and softer. this is granite you're saying this is granite yeah yeah this is uh rose granite yeah much easier to work marble um, oh yeah you wouldn't i mean granite sculptors know this like they, they, yeah. they don't really often choose to work in mediums <laughs> like granite it's tough i mean it lasts a long time obviously uh, but yeah, this is a real tough medium, but whoever was making these things seemed to like working in it or they found it easy. And to me, it, it's kind of represents the most efficient way to make a face. So if you are designing this again, not just carving it, but designing it, then you could design half the face and just mirror image it and boom, there's your other half of the face. And it, I often, these things are mysterious to me. I mean, I genuinely think there's, they're a little bit alien in their appearance, in their perfection, in their symmetry. It's just, just mm -hmm. that Ozymandias poem it kind of summarizes and, and, and captures that to me, but it's, it's remarkable. And it's not just this face that we see this, we see this sort of symmetry and precision in head jets. We see it in, in, you know, it's the same face on, on all of these big statues. Chris Dunn's looked at that in the past. I think there's, you know, an endless number of applications for techniques like scanning to really get to the bottom of this uh, and, and study these things in more detail. Um, I got to get Chris Dunn on the show too, because you, definitely. You, yeah, you've mentioned him several times. Oh, yeah. He's done some incredible work. Love obviously. Chris. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big inspiration for me. Um, happy, I'm very, very um, grateful to be able to say I'm friends with him now. Like I, I, I talk to Chris fairly often, but tremendous inspiration for me. He's a big part. I mean, I, I think his books, uh, you know, will be treated as the, I think as, 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 I think they they move the ballpark, they move the whole thing forward since Petrie. Like he's he, he's a modern uh, successor to Petrie, and I do think his works will be appreciated in time for what they are. They, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of get scoffed at by the mainstream and ignored in general by the mainstream uh, today. But I do think that in the future that they'll be looked at and said, yeah, he was he was the guy that really moved this whole discussion forward. 
and made significant discoveries with his work. And he dedicated his life to a lot of it. And he, I mean, he he went out on a limb with with a lot of his work, but it's fascinating stuff. And I mean, there's nobody more qualified to talk about these types of things, like a you know, literally a manufacturing engineer that's been in the game for 50 years. He's uh, looking at it all from an engineering standpoint. Yeah, well, that's what I appreciate about yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, he's he's a manufacturing engineer in the aerospace industry, and he's he he is he. If you want detailed a detailed study of things like the saw cuts, the tube drills, the statues. I mean, go buy Chris's books. Yeah. Uh, I, I use a lot of his information in my videos and credit him for it. And I've also interviewed him on, on my channel. Yeah. It's wonderful work. Um, yeah. He, he's been a huge inspiration for this. I think, yeah, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now without him. Yep. Um, the head jets or head dresses. Head jets are there too. Yeah. yeah. What, what, yeah, so um, head jets are the crowns. They're also, there's two types. Of, in fact, this shows you both the head jet right here and the patient in the rear. Uh, these are actually complex curved geometries. They, they have these compound curved surfaces. Again, these are all images from Chris Dunn's book. Um, you know, there's, they're, they're, they're perfectly symmetrical uh, when you're front on from left to right. Here's another um, reverse transparency on center. But obviously these things that kind of like, they, sh they go backwards as well. So they're not, per they're not, they're symmetrical from one axis or one perspective, but they're compound curved surfaces. So they, you know, the, the curvatures change as they move uh, out there and then they reverse on themselves in some cases. And these would have been made out of one solid block. Oh, of totally. Yeah. The whole statue would have been made out of them. Today, they're all cut up into different pieces. But I mean, these are marvels of engineering. He's a yeah. very complex pattern. If you, and, and, it, and at Luxor, you can still run your hand over a few of them and they're just immaculate. Like yeah. they're, they're perfectly polished and smooth. You can't sense any deviations or waviness in the stone. I mean, you see the same thing in the curved surfaces of the cornice blocks that you find at Giza, these perfectly polished and consistent curvatures. Like, it's machine-made. It's not – It's. It, I don't have any other explanation for it. These are machine-made, they're designed, and then mach, machine-made. Something that's guiding the the cutting tool that's extremely precise and consistent and, and, and adhering to a particular pattern. Um, I don't have any other, you know, explanation for it. Uh, there's it, – you can't – you can't do it any other way as far as I'm concerned. Like, yeah, these, these head jets are And have we found examples? Remarkable. Have we recovered head jets? Have we found examples of those from the Egyptian time period that, that they actually did wear these things during that time I period? I don't know. I don't okay. think so. I mean, certainly they're depicted. I know we found some crowns and jewelry. I'm not, I'm honestly not that up to date on the, like, the jewelry side of things. Okay. Uh, I, you know, I often skip like the Tutankhamun or Tanis exhibits at the, mm -hmm. in the museum where they have all the jewelry. They're cool. I've been in there before, but I actually don't know if we found replicas of these that, yeah, not, not, not okay. attached to the giant statues. They're, yeah. yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're just utterly amazing. I don't, I don't know what else to say about them. I mean, they're, yeah, I, it's, it's a, it's a it's it's easy to talk about precision and it's a, probably the best way to start it is to talk about you know flat surfaces straight lines 90 degree corners mm -hmm. but in a lot of ways these compound curved surfaces are, are another degree of precision that's 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 even more sophisticated because to get that accurate and to keep it consistent and where it's not a you know it's symmetrical sort of when you're front on but it's actually leaning back you know, when you're on the side, I mean, keeping all that consistent and and, and implementing precision in a three dimensional object like a statue head or a, or a head jet is is utterly remarkable and probably far more difficult than than making a flat surface or a or you know a ninety degree corner in stone. Yep. Yep. The uh, if there was a civilization, if there was a group of people, you know, likely would have extended past that period. We talked a little bit about uh, past that area. We talked a little bit about South America. Mm -hmm. Um, what other areas throughout the world kind of pique your interest as it relates to this topic? Where do we see evidence? Oh, there's, there's, there's a number of them. Um, I mean, one of the big ones for me is, is uh, I mean, Turkey. Turkey. Turkey, yeah. Baalbek in Lebanon, yeah. Easter Island, uh, China. I mean, they're, they're all over the place. There's, yeah. there's a lot of places that I, I, I had the first, I had the chance to visit Turkey for the first time this year, and I'm getting to Baalbek in Lebanon next year for the first time. Super excited about Baalbek. But you see this type of work. It depends on, you know, what flavor of it you're looking for. But I mean, if you're talking about megalithic architecture, there's that's this Turkey, right? That's Baalbek, Baalbek, where you've got I mean, those massive stones. Yeah, I mean, Italy and Rome, and you also have some remnants. I think there's evidence for it in places like Italy and 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 Greece as well. But you also have a much more defined, I think, 
culture that built on top of that stuff. And mm -hmm. I think that's exactly what we're looking at it in Baalbek, it's, which is in Lebanon. It's 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 attributed as a Roman temple today, Temple of Bacchus, Temple of Jupiter, multiple temples on this site known as Baalbek. But um, there's it has a layer a layer to it, like an older layer that that's almost like this giant megalithic pedestal. Uh, that upon which the Romans then built their pedestal and their temple. Like they, the Romans would always build their temples on a pedestal. But if they built Baalbek, then they built a pedestal, then a pedestal, then a temple. It'd be the only case of a double pit. And that's not what happened. There's, in fact, at the bottom sort of platform, I'd call it, or pedestal, they probably found this and said, this would be a perfect place to build our temple because. So the mainstream theory is that the Romans, Romans did it all. Romans did all of, yeah. of Baalbek. Yeah, okay. I mean, but you mean there's the the famous there's the famous trilophon that's in that big U shaped sort of wall and pedestal that's this provides the platform for this for what is the Roman construction on top. Do you have a picture of that? The trilophon, um, I might. Yes, it's uh, where is large? I think huge objects here are probably be <laughs> yeah. a huge object. Uh, I might not have the actual trilophon, but I have no, the but, I do have uh, the quarry here. Um, um, there's wow. a dude standing in there. So the, the, these are a little bigger, but the, the stones in the trilithon, there's three of them. They're about 900 tons each. They're lifted up off the ground. They're they're perfectly, you know, you can't fit a razor blade between them kind of thing. And then about a mile or so away is the quarry at Baalbek. And this is what we're looking at here. And in fact, this is... That's the quarry. That's the quarry. It's about a mile or so, uh, a little bit more maybe, distant from the site. Uh, there's... For the longest time, they thought there was just the one stone here, the one on the right. It's called the Stone of the South or the Stone of the Pregnant Woman. Uh, something like 1,500 tons, this thing. Wow. And Three, then, three million pounds. Yeah. Wow. And then and then they, they excavated, they dug down, and you know what they found? More of them beneath it. You can actually see maybe one, maybe two more uh, beneath that stone. So almost like they stacked them up. The one on the bottom is even bigger. It's, it's, I think it's closer to 2,000 tons. And these are limestone. They're not granite, but but... Regardless, I mean, this is these are gigantic pieces of stone. There's, you know, the Romans would have known about the top one. I doubt they had any clue the ones on the bottom existed. Uh, they probably weren't likely moving them at all either. And, um, and do we see any other evidence for the for the Romans using stones that are that size no, anywhere else? Nowhere else in no, the world. No, okay. nothing like that order of magnitude. They made some big stuff. I mean, so you they, know, the, they, the columns of the Pantheon might be 60, 70 tons, or, or maybe that. In that realm, they might have done some things in that realm. They and, certainly took ob obelisks from Egypt and stood them up, uh, but I, nothing in the thousand ton, re like single piece stone. The, realm. the Romans were using um, they were using cement essentially, right? Yeah, I mean, Roman uh, cement, ancient cement, and that's what they did. The uh, all the the major structures within Rome, the mostly, yeah, yeah, and they'd use a lot of marble. Uh, they would stack. Sure. I mean, Greeks and Romans both typically would build columns from. You know, stacked rounds of of marble, right. and things like that. But but they, they also did do single piece granite columns. But it's just nothing. It, they don't show anywhere near the same sophistication or precision that the Egyptian, the ancient Egyptian stuff does. So outside of outside of a few structures that may be fifty or sixty tons that the Romans might have built, single blocks that were fifty or sixty tons. Like we jumped from fifty or sixty tons to fifteen hundred tons. Right, or, right. Right. Pretty much. Yeah. I, okay. I can't be definitive about that. I honestly haven't looked in into it that hard with the Romans and Greeks in terms of single piece artifacts. Mm -hmm. But nothing comes to my mind that's that's that's, you know, in that realm of, you know, even four hundred tons. I mean I I, I I do the whole logistical aspect of moving extremely heavy loads is another vector that I look at. So, you know, machining, tool marks, precision, and then logistics, uh, logistical issues is the other aspect that I look at when it comes to like, I think there's a, you need technology to do this. And I kind of draw the line at the 200 to 300 ton range. Like I, I think it's possible to move using primitive methods, 100, 100, it's been demonstrated. You could do 100, couple hundred tons even. Uh, you know, flat level ground. It's just, there's ways to do it, but but you know, I think you know, moving stuff down underground into the Serapium tunnels at 100 tons, it's a, probably a, needs some. It needs a different explanation. And then certainly once you get to the, you know, 400 tons, 500, 1,000 tons, mm -hmm. like that's that's a whole other world mm -hmm. of, of logistical challenges, like material how, failure. How many cranes would it take to lift? Well, a... we we probably have 
cranes that could do that or a couple of i mean the biggest cranes i'm sure could do it but, okay. but you'd probably need a couple of the land-based ones that you can maybe drive in there to lift something like that maybe even more i mean that's it's a non insignificant load i've had a lot of comments from people that work in that industry like yeah that's nuts if you think you can do it any other way i mean like i said it's just it's not like a linear um the difficulty of of moving the load isn't like a linear increase with the mass it's right you know the difficulty gets like logarithmic or exponential or whatever it's you know, material failure. Like, remember, the Egyptians weren't using steel. Like, Egypt, it, certainly, the later Romans were, were using force multipliers. They you pulleys and capstans and techniques like that. The, as far as we know, the dynastic Egyptians used none of that. They, they, they had no the pulleys, pulley. no mm. capstans. Human horsepower. They used levers, wood, like wooden levers. Mm. They used sleds. Even in the early days, they didn't use wheels, and wow. they would just had humans and ropes and horsepower. Like that's you're stretching credulity when if you're suggesting these guys were capable of moving. 400 ton load, let alone a thousand or 1200 ton loads i mean the unfinished obelisk at aswan's 1200 tons and you had to lift that thing up out of the quarry move it over rocky ground somehow get it to wherever it's got to go it's not place, place it perfectly not happening yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah it's not happening so that's i think that's a big indicator you see that in you see these huge objects like this in um you know in balbec uh there's there's a there's a few other theorized ones around the place but yeah, the logistical challenges of Baalbek, these are probably the biggest, I think these are the biggest quarried stones in the world, and I'm, I can't wait to see them when I get there next year. Mm-hmm. So. Cool, cool. Yeah, and then in Turkey, is there any other, uh, well, I guess you've got Gobekli Tepe. Well, t- Turkey is interesting. There are sites that match the sort of megalithic nature. There's a few, um, Z- Z- Zanaki Tepe is one that I'm particularly interested in. But Turkey in itself has been very interesting in that it's uncovered, and certainly in recent years, what I would term an entirely a lost chapter of human civilization. So, you know, we, we often thought that, you know, civilization began with the Babylonians, the Sumerians, um, you know, and then followed by the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans and the Chinese. And we were hunter gatherers. And we were before. hunter gatherers before that. Mm-hmm. Right. And, mm-hmm. and in Turkey, in the, they discovered a site in the fifties actually and because of the stonework at this little pot-bellied hill that was called in, you know, Gobekli Tepe is the translation, they, they thought it was like more of a modern or, or not very old cemetery because of the quality of these, these stone work, these stone pillars that were sticking up out of the ground. And they were like, forget about it. It's just, it's not anything worth digging up. But it wasn't until the ni- late 1990s when the German Archaeological Institute came along and, um, um, that... Uh, Klaus Schmidt, I think. I think that's right. Yeah. Yes, he was the guy. He's unfortunately passed away since then. He uncovered that site, and it turns out to be a massive megalithic site that's full of stone pillars, uh, you know, stone circles. And then they very comprehensively carbon dated this thing to like 11, 12,000 years old. And, and that, you know, that's kind of, again, like could potentially just be an earlier state for it. It could be much older than that. And it's a significant site. Like this huge, it's all of these these massive stone pillars i wouldn't say it it reflects the same degree of precision that you see in in sort of egypt or south america but mm-hmm. it's none the, nonetheless you have like 18 feet tall stone pillars that weigh 20 to 30 tons uh it's it's sophisticated stonework it's a sign of civilization and you know it was a mis- it was a it was a it was out there on its own for a while there go back to tepe it's really challenging the archaeological world and they thought that you know for me it requires civilization to achieve this sort of stuff you need specialization you need other people doing the 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 food growing you need people have need to have the time to be able to specialize and organize to do architecture like this and it's a large site um to this day though they still don't they still they they basically changed the definition of hunter you look it up on wikipedia they say that the site was built by hunter gatherers who also happened to like to do megalithic stonework and this type of thing i think it's ridiculous and it's been proved to be quite ridiculous because since then we found um, Karahan Tepe, which is even older than Gobekli Tepe, it's five or six times larger. Uh, some extremely interesting stonework on that site, and then there's in the last just few years alone, we've found now forty to eighty other sites wow. in this region of southeastern Turkey. Wow. These just like it's civilization, man. That there's yeah. there was there was a different climate. We know that the climate changed um, back then. That it was a that it, it's, it was an environment that could have supported a large population. And evidently there was, and there were cities, and there were structures, and there were was a, it was a culture that we just know nothing about. And I, I draw a comparison to like the Amazon, like as a result of deep 
deforestation, we've found the remnants of massive earthworks and, you know, cities the size of London in like the 1800s in the Amazon that we just like, we have no clue other than a few rumors, a lost city of Z and, you know, the, the manuscript 512 and some of these other really interesting stories about, you know, potential cities in the Amazon. We know zip about it, but yeah. but we're seeing the evidence for it. Like it's like so it's pretty possible that there are lost chapters of human civilization. We just don't have any knowledge of it. And I, I think that's we have proof of that. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fantastic. Um, good. Yeah. The um, <clears throat> you know so that's kind of that's kind of the Turkey area. I know that there's there's these underground caverns that exist with the underground caves that Cappadocia. exist. Mm-hmm. within within turkey and and um potentially other spots throughout the world plenty of them yeah i mean the, the huge city I mean, in cappadocia and darren that there, there's there's some of those huge you're talking like tens of thousands of people could be housed down there like underground cities um and so what would what you know hmm. i i guess i think about you know um gobekli tepe and and that was that the date of that construction was what was it about twelve thousand years ago yeah about that yeah and we know that because Bang on with the younger dryas right on with the younger dryas yeah in the middle of the younger dryas yes. essentially and yeah. so and we know that because how we we carbon dated we carbon date well so it's interesting that there's yes we carbon dated some mat- organic material that we found in there and that's the that's the youngest date that they have so that's like the last occupation of it was then and they think it was buried or at least stopped being used by humans about then it must have been buried because i mean that's one of the other reasons they think it was deliberately buried although the latest research is sort of starting to go back on that idea it was more likely it was buried over time um yeah, there's some still some debate and active research happening in this space, but for the, the dating is bang on, like the carbon mm-hmm. dating. And now what's interesting is it's this tale of two industries thing again, right? It's 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 you know, I don't know if I have um I probably do have some images of Gobekli Tepe here. So it's other vectors, I think. Let's see. Yeah, hopefully it's here. Yeah, so Gobekli Tepe, let's see. You have uh in fact this this image probably covers it because it's probably the only one i have on this computer right now yeah um so what you have and this is it's kind of this image of the vulture stone here you, what you have is these different face so you see this one particular stone this is this is indicative of, of a lot of the, the the central pillars in the in the in these stone circles you have these intricately carved large stone pillars this isn't a particularly big one although the iconography on it's very interesting but they're surrounded by these walls you see this wall is like this is even the walls kind of built it's built around the sure. stone. You see just behind it and mm-hmm. up to the top left. Um, you have these walls of loose stone blocks, right? It's it's like you have these beautiful, and they would go down to the bedrock and that would all be flat and they would have these things inset into the ground, these giant pillars. And then you have these really rough stone walls that kind of encompass them. A lot of times they're encompassing the stone. They're encompassing, like supporting the stone. They're, they're even covering up artwork. And in some places, you actually have pieces of broken pillars that are in the walls where they've made the walls from local stones and these pieces of broken pillars. To me, that's indicative. I think you you could be definitely looking at at, at two different phases of construction, sure, right? Sure. The pillars might have been there, then they fell apart or whatever, or the site was abandoned, and then some other culture came along and said, Well, this is pretty cool. We're going to restore it and support it as best we can. So they the dating the material that long story short the material that they dated the site with came from material in the walls. Okay. Okay. So it could have been a much later phase of occupation and building on the site that, mm-hmm. that correlates to like eleven twelve thousand years ago. Then what? And we just have no clue when the <laughs> when yeah. the first um, you know the first the, the first building phase there when they when they made these pillars was because. Yeah, you have broken, literally have pieces of broken pillars in the walls. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because you have the um, you have this site being covered up on this side of the world about twelve thousand years ago ish, mm-hmm. and you have the you have Easter Island mm-hmm. on the other side of the world that got covered up. Right, those mm-hmm. those statues used to be fully above ground. We thought for years in our civilization that those statues that it was just the heads and then right we, we dug down deep i guess it was yeah. this century or the oh like, it was this century this yeah. century we dug yeah, yeah and well and, no with well i guess the, the 20th century 20th okay yeah. and we dug down and found those to be <clears throat> about three times taller than we had yeah, thought full that they bodies. were and and so those Crazy. i guess the story is that those were also intentionally covered is that correct i'm not sure about okay. them i i couldn't tell you um 
I mean, it's, if it's a natural sediment, it, I don't know how long it would take natural sediment to fill it up that to that point. Right. I'd say right. That, so. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I think about and I, I think about the theory of um, Jimmy Corsetti, who I know, you know, you you know well, and yep. you've um, his his work on um, Africa and the Sahara and mm-hmm. the you know potentially a great flood that went through that area. Yeah. Um, you know, as you look at the bedrock that's kind of been stripped away, if you you know, if you look at it from space and it, it really does look like uh, we'll add pictures up later, but it really does look like water, you know, tremendous amounts of water that have flown. I, I think there's evidence, strong evidence for it. Yeah. I mean, this whole the whole mid Saharan Sea and 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 I think for sure at some point that must have happened. I, I think that the question is around the timeline is when, of when that sure, might have happened. Sure. Um, but, but we yeah, see we see salt these huge floods have happened yeah salt we, we all see of that salt deposits all throughout africa yeah. you see those those ripples that are um you know that could have only have happened with you know um tremendous tremendous oh. amount of water i mean you're talking a thousand feet or more of water to form some of those ripples that more, you would see yeah. Yeah, more i mean same thing at the channel scadlands like the evidence for the massive out floods mm-hmm. uh, at the end of the ice age i mean that yeah. that's you have 30 40 feet high current ripples right you know. right so here's a crazy theory for you <laughs> so what if um i mean could it have been possible that a lot of these places if there was some massive event where water was you know going into africa onto the continents you know from the west to the east is what it kind of mm-hmm. looks like um, may have happened if you even if you look at um, the western coast of the united states you know mm-hmm. you've got the great salt lake forming um, off the west coast potentially a water event that came on to north america and south america you have um another great giant salt deposit on the west coast of south america yep. um you know, could it have been that Gobekli Tepe, that Easter Island, were were not intentionally buried, but were actually covered up by some sort of a, a some sort of a flooding event that happened in our distant past? It's an interesting idea. I've, I often try to think about the possibility for for floods in some of these areas. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it depends. In a lot of cases, you 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 could see evidence for uh, particularly for material that gets carried by flood that's a long way away that's out of place so this that you can find if particular place has been buried or it's collected sediment from a flood you typically see like waterborne um objects in that right that's you know I, and i don't know how much evidence we found specifically in those places of that type of thing you know like the the river worn or the all the the water worn stuff or something that's come from a long way away which i know we we do see in in other areas i know you know like randall carlson talks a lot about those artifacts that we see as a result of gigantic floods coming out of the Pacific Northwest and and that area. Uh, I mean, I don't rule it out. I mean, I you know, Fl- Flinders Petrie even in Egypt found evidence for for gigantic floods that, that came through there at some point. Something happened, like mm-hmm. for sure. You know, if you you have either mega tsunamis or or you know impact related things or just just tremendous outflows of water coming off the ice sheets. I mean these. It's as it's an astronomical amount of water that we we have we can't really uh, justify, it is. and you can't you can't even think about. It. I mean, and the ice sheets are of course fresh water, you know, which right. would have, which would have formed the Great right. Lakes in the United States, but they wouldn't account for all of the western to eastern movement of the water right. onto the continents. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for example, I th- I potentially think some of the great floods that could have happened in Egypt, and this may even be the source of the biblical flood. You know, wasn't um, wasn't fresh water so much as it, it might have been the result of the Burkle Crater event, which was, a, I think it was 5,000 years ago. Uh, so right around the period that you might be, the Old Testament might have been uh-huh, sure, started sure. to be conceived of, yeah. you know, 20, you know, 2000, 3000 to 2000 BC kind of thing. Uh, you know, there, we know there was a giant, um, like a large impact into the Indian Ocean. So there's like a 30 kilometer crater on the ground, on the bottom of the Indian Ocean. If you look on Google Maps at Western Australia and Madagascar in Africa, you'll see these chevrons and these these flow patterns from where right. these you know then a thousand feet high, like these mm-hmm. were giant waves that washed up inland. But that would have that would have sent a wave up north too through the Persian Gulf, right up into that area, and mm-hmm. would have flooded the hell out of it. Like yep. it might have been, and then there would have been a massive rain out event, perhaps forty days and forty nights or something. But like you know that, that as a result of all the water getting thrown up into the atmosphere from this 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 massive 
event and that event on its own is was nothing in comparison to the younger drives like it was wasn't even a blip in comparison to the younger drives right but it would have been an extremely traumatic and global event that would have been felt all around the world and mm -hmm. and the effects of it would have gone on for years so yeah i mean i there's i think at the end of the day you know it's we have gotten used to very calm and docile and, right. and pleasant conditions here and right. You know, that's not the environment that we truly live in on a longer time scale. And, you know, kind of pro projecting out further on a long enough time scale, it's, you know, it's guaranteed to, it almost, the, the rate of percentage of this happening again approaches 100%, right? It's on a long enough time frame, this stuff will happen again, which is, I guess, part of the reason why I think this is a whole, it's an important topic to, to, to talk about. Because I think it, we we as as humans, our lives are so short. You know, we we tend to look at things in these tiny little time frames. It's like, oh man, that's a once in a hundred year event, which is on the on a geological time frame very common. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. on longer time frames, like these things do seem to happen, and we've been learning they happen more and more frequently. And a lot of them are going to threaten civilization, our way of life, even our survival as a species in in the long run. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. I I I I am very much open to the the idea of you know, cataclysmic events having shaped some of these sites yeah. uh, in the past. Yeah. yeah, me too. It's fascinating. I hope to maybe talk to Jimmy at some point, uh, oh, yeah. Jimmy, about this. It's... I can connect you. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I'd love to have him on. Uh, I, I'd love to close on your thoughts on just, you know, I think a lot of people might say, well, why is this work important? You know, what, what is it about your work that, you know, why, why does it fascinate you? Why, what, what, what at the end of the day, why is it that you do what you do? And, and what do you think that we can learn from this work? We, we've kind of been dancing around and talk, well, talking about some of the subjects around why I do think it's important because this concept of humans and civilization and our place on the planet and, and who we are is, is you know, is, I think it's it's not we don't consider topics like catac like the things we've been talking about the cataclysm so much. I mean, it's becoming a little more popular now, maybe becoming a little more uh, part of our human uh, collective psyche. But in general, I think one of our challenges is 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 that we all grow up with this fundamental tenet of what it means to be a modern human. I'm kind of pretty much limiting myself to the Western world here. I think we all, to a lesser or greater degree get told in school that yep we were we were cavemen we were stone men and six thousand years ago we we became we started civilization and it's been more or less this part i know there's ups and downs but there's this path from then to now like it's we were cavemen and we're essentially the result of of what civilization is you know we, we've gone from from hunter gatherers to to us in this you know this path from that's taken six thousand years and here we are today and this is the only way that civilization happens and this is what we do and I just think that is an ingrained part of, it's like a tenet of what it means to be a modern human being, particularly in the West. And we just heads down and go about our lives and worry about everything else and with, without, the, without worrying too much about that. But, you know, I, I think that if we, had a, if, we, if we could change that, if there was a possibility of, of, of understanding that some of the things you were talking about, like, no, actually, we, we may well have been here before. We may well have... have gone down that technological path even uh, i think as different as it probably was to what our civilization is and you know we were wiped out and and in fact and rather than being this linear growth from stone age to today it's this it's this circular or or, or repeating pattern that, that oscillates between civilization and cataclysm and it's every time we're rolling the dice whether we survive it or not uh and that we're on that same cycle and that on a long enough time frame we're going to go to the other side of that cycle again. I think that could genuinely change our behavior as, as a species. I think it would make us probably work together a little bit more. We'd probably focus more on solving the longer term pro uh, problems that, that threaten our species. Uh, and I, I often summarize this by saying maybe we'd spend a little bit less money on tanks and guns and a little bit more money on exploring space and, mm -hmm. and, and working with each other just to, to solve those problems. I, and it's an it's an altruistic goal. Like I admit admit it. Like it's this crazy sort of altruism, and and almost hopelessly optimist optimistic version of of the world where that could potentially happen. But it's not without precedent either. Is what I'd say is that there are there are movements and and there's been modern examples of how an idea can shape our behavior and change our 
uh, in almost every aspect of our life. And the example I like to use here is, is climate change. So, so whether or not you agree with it, and there's certainly plenty of problems with the modern interpretation of whatever those words mean to you or to most people, uh, it's it's been a concept that um, has ingrained itself in the zeitgeist of humanity. In the last 20, what, 25 years, something like this, it's, it changes investment decisions. It's, it's steered technological development and in the search for like, you know, clean energy. And, you know, it changes in a lot of, particularly in newer generations, like human behavior, how we interact with each other, how we interact with the planet. So this isn't a commentary about, about climate change itself, more, more an observation that it's a concept that has changed our behavior and it's changed our, our technology. It's changed our investment, the way we work with each other and all these types of things. So that mechanism exists. And I think this is one that, you know, if we could, if we could spread this idea and have more people consider it and it become rather than, you know, getting the, the classroom version of the 6,000 years ago, we were stone age and now we're civilized to like, no, we've been civilized before. We, we've, we've gone down the path before. And we're, you know, it's a, it's, it's more of a, a circular repeating pattern for us, or at least it's happened at least once before. Uh, I think it could really change our behavior in the long term and benefit us as a, as a species. And I, I remain ever hopeful that, that it might actually achieve that status at some point, whether it's my lifetime or, or, you know, 10 generations down the line. But that's the, that's why I think it's important. And that's kind of the, the overall goal and what I'm interested in. Really cool. Really cool. Cheers. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. The, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm, I'm really hoping to continue to explore this topic over the next couple of episodes. I'm really honored to have you on as my awesome. first episode and, uh, you know, Pleasure. to, 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 uh, be able to, I uh, had the day off today. So to be able to spend the day with you has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I want to, you know, this ever since, you know, really seeing kind of Graham Hancock on the Joe Rogan show and then seeing you on the Joe Rogan show has really piqued my interest in this topic. And, uh, I've just been, you know, down that YouTube rabbit hole for really the last, you know, uh, <laughs> eight, nine months or whatever it's been. So it's been, a lot of fun. It's been amazing. I hope that you'll maybe help me connect with a couple of uh, sure. the other guys. You know, I'd love to love to get, um, you know, uh, for sure, Chris on and and uh, potentially Jimmy. And um, but um, we, we can figure all that those details out. Yeah. But um, I do appreciate the time that you spent with me today. And I do appreciate explore, exploring this you know, this really, uh, fascinating, fascinating topic then. And I know Thanks, that yeah, you get a lot of, uh, you know, pushback, obviously, you know, with your work, you get a lot of people, yeah. it's difficult when you're challenging the mainstream, yeah. the, 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 the establishment, the accepted thoughts out there. Part you know, of the game. Part of the game. Yeah. 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 Like you can't, yeah. you can't have a thin skin and, uh, and be out there on YouTube saying, you know, speculative things that challenge kind of the mainstream. You, you're definitely going to get pushback. So for sure. Fine. For sure. But keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. It's very important work. And, you know, we've got to keep open minds to these types of things, you know, and, and really to everything. If we, if we, if we think that we've got things completely figured out, then that's the point in time when we stop advancing, we stop evolving, you know, we just kind of stay at that level of, of awareness and understanding and, and, and you continuing to challenge these, these issues is really important. So I applaud you for doing it and keep up the great work. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. For sure. Great to see you, man. That Cheers. was awesome. Yeah, dude. Yep. Cheers. Cool.